Good meeting. Mm, the first speaker is Professor Brian Battelle from University of Pittsburgh, and he will talk about thermal misalignment of scalar dark matter. Uh, please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Pyongwan and uh, Young Min, for the nice invitation. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you about some work uh, I've done recently with Akshay Galsasi, who is a postdoc uh, here in Pittsburgh. Um, and the title of the talk is Thermal Misalignment of Scalar Dark Matter. Uh, it, in summary, it's essentially a new uh, mechanism to dynamically generate uh, mis large misalignment of scalar dark matter uh, in the early universe. And uh, it comes from a coupling to uh, particles in the thermal bath, which generate uh, an effective potential, and that drives the misalignment at, at uh, early times. Um, okay, so I, I, I see there's a lot of uh, dark matter talks at this workshop, so I don't think I need to spend any time motivating it, just to say that it is one of the big outstanding puzzles in particle physics and cosmology. Um, and uh, perhaps one way to frame it for purposes of this talk is uh, we, one big question about dark matter is we'd like to know how it's produced in the early universe. And um, by finding compelling mechanisms that can also perhaps guide our uh, experimental efforts. Um, and uh, there's a, a, already a vast landscape of possible dark matter candidates. Um, and uh, theorists are still exploring this landscape vigorously to try to find new ideas. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the ultralight uh, dark matter regime, where dark matter is a uh, bosonic field. Um, and so here's the motivation and plan. So uh, when, we when we usually talk about ultralight scalar dark matter, we think about the misalignment mechanism as a sort of generic dark matter production mechanism. Um, uh, I'll just, just as a point of comparison to what we do, I'll just bring up that that these uh, two points perhaps, which are possible sensitivity to the initial conditions, uh, as well as a question of how to connect the abundance with short distance uh, particle physics parameters. And uh, in contrast, in our mechanism, um, what we'll see is that the dark matter abundance and the misalignment is dynamically generated from uh, generic initial conditions. I'll say exactly what I mean by generic uh, a little bit later. The mechanism relies on a coupling of the scalar dark matter to a fermion in thermal equilibrium um, and the resulting finite temperature potential. And so I'll, I'll basically just walk through the mechanism. Um, uh, and then uh, once we see uh, how the abundance is achieved, I'll discuss a, the phenomenology of a realistic scenario where dark matter couples to the muon, okay? Just as, a, as, as a, essentially an example scenario. And also just point you to the talk by Ung Jin Chung, uh, who also uh, has been exploring some related ideas. Okay, so um, I think it's good to start just by maybe reviewing the classic misalignment mechanism as a, as a point of comparison, and then we'll see uh, what, how we're, what we're doing is a little bit different. So um, uh, let's just consider the, the dynamics of a massive scalar field in the early universe, phi, uh, starting from some initial field value uh, the scalar field will evolve according to this equation of motion. Uh, H here is the Hubble parameter, uh, M phi is the mass. And uh, we let this system go. And so what happens at early times at high temperatures, the scalar field is held up by Hubble friction. And so we can see in the, in the plot, it retains a constant, it's approximately constant initial field value. Uh, it's just held there at its initial value for some time. Uh, as the universe cools, the Hubble eventually drops below the scalar mass. And this signals the onset of oscillations. And then uh, at later times, you see it oscillates and it's also being diluted due to the Hubble expansion. Um, and so this is the basic misalignment mechanism. And if, and if you study the uh, behavior of this system, you find that the energy density stored in the field redshifts like matter. So it scales in uh, like one over a cubed, the scale factor cubed, or uh, like temperature cubed. And so this is a good, uh, candidate for cold dark matter. And then you can estimate the relic density. Uh, so we can essentially take the energy density stored during uh, at the onset of oscillations, account for the redshift, um, divide by the critical density, and we get this expression. 
And what the, the main thing I want to highlight here is it depends on this initial uh, field value, phi initial. Okay, so this, this relic density uh, in some sense is controlled by this field value, which of course um, could be influenced and we expect it to be influenced perhaps by you know, the earlier, earlier periods in cosmology, for example, uh, during inflation. Okay. Okay, so now um, here is just a, a quick cartoon sketch of the ideas that we're exploring. So in the thermal misalignment mechanism, uh, basically what happens is there's a finite temperature effective potential that uh, operates at high temperatures and it causes uh, a new minimum to develop. And so the scalar field will roll towards that large, uh, that minimum at large field values generating misalignment. Um, at some point later, when the temperature is uh, of order of the oscillation temperature, when, the, when the, the effective mass of the scalar field is comparable to the Hubble, then this, the field will start to oscillate. Uh, and then at, at, uh, again, at low temperatures, you'll, it'll just behave like matter. So, uh, so this is kind of a sketch of the evolution of the field. The field will grow from some small initial field value um, to the time when it starts to oscillate. Uh, and then it will behave like matter. So it's really this initial phase that we're, we're focusing on. Um, just a, a few points of comparison. So um, in the classic misalignment mechanism, as I already mentioned, the oscillation amplitude and the resulting abundance is dictated by the initial uh, condition, the initial field value. Um, in contrast, uh, in our case, we'll, we will be dynamically generating this uh, misalignment or the, essentially the, the, the value of the field at the onset of oscillations from uh, some small initial field value. Um, and it turns out that this uh, uh, amplitude is insensitive to the initial conditions. So for a wide variety of different initial conditions, you'll approach the same oscillation amplitude. So that's, that's nice. So there's, there's a sense in which it's insensitive to initial conditions. Um, and then uh, finally, the, the main thing I want to point out is that the oscillation amplitude and the resulting abundance is connected very tightly to the Lagrangian parameters, the, the micros microscopic particle physics. So you can make predictions for the relic density. Um, they're the, the same couplings that you might use to probe the model with various different experiments or observations uh, can then be compared to the relic density prediction. So it's somehow um, analogous maybe, for example, to the WIMP case. Okay, And we'll see that a little, a little bit later when we study a specific model. Okay, so um, so that's the that's the broad overview. So now let me uh, discuss a little bit more detail. So uh, first, we'll just consider a simple kind of toy model with a scalar dark matter field phi and a Dirac fermion psi, and we'll assume the fermion is in thermal equilibrium with the plasma in the early universe. The dark matter couples to the fermion through a Yukawa interaction. So uh, so basically, we have the dark matter field, the um, the fermion field, and then there's this Yukawa coupling here. And I'm going to parameterize this Yukawa coupling uh, in this kind of strange way, where I divide the, the fermion mass by the Planck mass, and then the overall coefficient is this dimensionless parameter beta. Okay. Um, it'll turn out that we'll be interested in couplings beta that are uh, within a few orders of magnitude of, of one. And so what that means is that this Yukawa coupling is extremely feeble. Okay. So it's a very weak coupling. Um, the fermion. Uh, is in thermal equilibrium, so its free energy density will depend on its mass, uh, which in turn depends on the scalar field uh, background value. And so this free, this free energy density will in turn give a, an effective uh, potential to the scalar field, the finite temperature effective potential, and that'll be important. Okay, so uh, if we'd like to investigate the uh, early universe dynamics of the scalar field, we require the effective potential. And in general, there are these three terms, the, the tree level piece, the, the Coleman-Weinberg piece, uh, or the zero temperature one loop effective potential, as well as the one loop finite temperature potential. Okay. And um, for now, we're essentially just going to neglect the influence of the Coleman-Weinberg piece. And what we'll see is that this implies a fine tuning when the scalar is light. It's essentially just the usual hierarchy problem. So if we want to go into parameter space where the, the scalar field is very light and the coupling is not too small, then uh, we might expect, you, you know, just as, as we always do with, with uh, light scalars, that, that uh, this could influence it. But for now, we're just going to neglect it. So it's a, it constitutes a tuning in, in those regions of parameter space. Uh, so I'll just delineate where that is in the parameter space. Uh, as, I'll, as we'll show, 
uh, much of the interesting region from the point of view of dark matter abundance is in a, in a region where it's not tuned. Okay. All right, so then um, let's study the effective potential. Uh, so I'll start at low temperatures and um, we'll just keep turning up the temperature and see how things develop. So at low temperatures, we just have the classical tree level piece, which I'll just model as a, a quadratic piece. Um, the, the effect that the finite temperature piece is Boltzmann suppressed at low temperatures. So it has no effect essentially. Now we turn up the temperature. So temperatures of order of the fermion mass, we see that the blue piece here, the finite temperature uh, contribution starts to grow. We keep turning it up and then we can see it, it can really compete with the, uh, the, the classical piece, the quadratic piece. And in fact, a new minimum will develop uh, at large field values. And you can understand that by just studying the uh, high temperature expansion of the effective potential. And so you see that you get this effective fermion mass squared, which uh, the T squared piece uh, has this coefficient of the, the effective fermion mass squared. And that has this factor of one minus beta phi over M Planck squared. And so this will tend to drive the, the minimum uh, towards values of order M Planck over beta, okay? And so we see that in this picture. And then you can even turn up the temperature higher and, and you can see that uh, at, at large temperatures, the, the minimum is at uh, at large field values. Okay, so now that we understand the potential, we can uh, again, go back to understand how the, the scalar field will evolve and it's very simple. So we just start from a random initial field value, say after inflation, and then we turn on the temperature and the scalar field will then start to roll towards its minimum at high temperature, generating misalignment. Uh, as the temperature goes, uh, becomes of order of the fermion mass, the fermions start to drop out of the bath, uh, they become Boltzmann suppressed, so the minimum again moves towards the origin. Um, and at some point, the, uh, the phi will, uh, the phi mass will uh, become of order of the Hubble, um, the Hubble will become of order of the phi mass, and then the scalar field will start to oscillate. Okay, so that's the basic picture. Now to study this um, uh, in more details and, and uh, get some numerical results. Uh, I'll, I'll just kind of tell you uh, how we how we're approaching it. We're just trying to solve for the equation of motion, solve for the evolution of the scalar field, and um, and what you can see is that the uh, the effective uh, potential depends on this uh, ratio of the fermion mass to the temperature, and so it makes sense to change to this variable uh, y, which is just a, a proxy for the temperature, and so we just scale the temperature with the fermion mass. So when y is of order one the temperature is of order the fermion mass, and that typically marks the transition from the high temperature to the low temperature regime. Okay, so y, y of order one is an important uh, milestone. Um, I'll also introduce this dimensionless parameter, kappa. And um, kappa is just a ratio of uh, mass parameters, and you can just think of it as a proxy for the dark matter mass, okay? So when, the fer when I fix the fermion mass uh, to some value, then kappa is just uh, essentially controlled by the dark matter mass. Um, there's some other parameters that start to enter. Uh, this parameter gamma, you can essentially ignore it. Uh, and what follows, it's of order one. Uh, it depends on the relativistic degrees of freedom in the bath, but uh, it'll, be, it'll be just a, an order one parameter for our purposes. Um, and then we can just solve the equation of motion. Uh, it depends on the two parameters, beta and kappa. And uh, given some initial conditions and model parameters, we can solve the equation to determine the evolution. And so that's shown here. This is one example. And so in this plot, uh, we see the, the, we're plotting the, uh, the, the scalar field value uh, as a function of, the, of y or the temperature. Okay, so going to large uh, values of y means we're going to high temperatures. So uh, we start out at some small initial field value and we see that uh, the, the scalar field grows, it's starting to roll towards its minimum at high field values. Um, and then at some point um, uh, you reach this point where the Hubble uh, is of order of the fermion mass, uh, of order of the scalar mass, and then you, uh, the oscillations uh, begin, okay? And so then in this late regime, it's, it's behaving like matter. Okay, so we can um, try to get a better understanding by studying the effective potential at high temperatures. Uh, so I, I've just written that out here, and there's two contributions. There's the scalar field mass term, the, the, just the, the tree level Lagrangian, um, and then there is the uh, temperature dependent piece. And um, you can translate those into the parameters that I mentioned, the kappa parameter, which is the, the scalar mass essentially, the y parameter, 
and you can minimize this. And uh, there, there are essentially two solutions. So at high temperature, as I already alluded to, the, the minimum is at this value M Planck over beta. And, um, and then at somewhat lower temperatures, then uh, you'll see that it goes like Y squared. So it's starting to fall again, back towards the origin. So the minimum is moving back towards the origin. Okay. Um, and so this, this is just uh, in line with the, the picture I've already sketched. Um, and now we can also try to understand the initial uh, evolution, this initial trajectory. And um, we can understand that by uh, essentially noticing that uh, at very high temperatures, the dominant piece of the potential is just this slope, this linear slope uh, that goes like T squared. Okay. Um, you can just to see where that comes from. If you look at this term, you'll have a cross term. And so you get this, this slope. Uh, so that leads to a very simple dynamics. The scalar field essentially just slow rolls. Um, and you just have this sort of terminal velocity uh, equation. Uh, you can solve that. And so it just says that the scalar field uh, increases with time, with cosmic time. Um, and then uh, provided that your initial field value is small, compared to your event, eventual oscillation amplitude, okay, as well as you start early enough at some early enough time, which is very reasonable, then you see that this initial, uh, this solution is uh, essentially independent of the uh, initial conditions, okay? And that, that's also what we see here. So there's uh, three different values of the initial field uh, configuration and then uh, the evolution, that, and they just match onto this, um, this uh, trajectory, which goes like one over Y squared or T, okay? Okay, so we understand that it's not sensitive to the initial conditions. Um, then finally, we can uh, try to understand when oscillations begin. And so for that, we just uh, compare the effective fermion mass, uh, which has two contributions, the, the classical term as well as the uh, finite temperature piece. And we compare that to the Hubble parameter. Uh, we set this condition, Hubble equal to the uh, effective mass, we can derive these, uh, the value of the, the oscillation temperature, the, the value of Y oscillation. Um, and there are two limits. One is for essentially large values of beta. In that case, the oscillation uh, temperature divided by the fermion mass scales like the coupling beta, uh, as well as one for low values of beta. And in that case, it goes like square root of kappa, uh, or essentially square root of the, the dark matter mass. Um, and uh, if, if the oscillation temperature is, if, if, if it turns out that the oscillations happen at low temperature below the fermion mass, then the bare mass term dominates. And then again, it will go, the, the oscillation value of Y will just be square root of kappa, okay? And so putting all of this together, it suggests that there are three qualitatively distinct regions in this uh, kappa beta parameter space. And uh, I'll just show that in a second. The boundary of these regions are defined by the lines Y equals one and this line beta, uh, proportional to square root of kappa. Okay, there, so there are these three regions. Um, this region with large beta, uh, typically it tends to give you too much uh, dark matter relic density. And so I'm not gonna discuss it here. Essentially what happens in this region is that the scalar field can evolve all the way towards the minimum. And then uh, you tend to um, get too large of an oscillation amplitude. However, in these other two regions, which I'll call region one here and region two and this for, for low values of kappa, uh, you can get the right relic density. Okay, so I'll, I'll discuss then uh, in these regions uh, essentially what happens. Okay, so to, to try to get an estimate, uh, we can look into first this region one, which is this uh, val larger larger values of the parameter kappa or larger dark matter masses essentially. Uh, in this region, um, y oscillation is greater than one. And um, so how do, we, how do we go about finding the relic density? Well, in the, in the region where Y oscillation is greater than one and, uh, and large values of kappa, you can find the oscillation temperature. Okay, we did that uh, just a bit ago. It goes like square root of kappa. You can take the initial trajectory, which we can solve uh, analytically or semi-analytically. And we can just plug in then uh, the value of, the, of Y oscillation into this equation and we can get an estimate, estimate of the oscillation amplitude. Okay, and then we uh, go ahead and can calculate the relic density, we calculate the energy density, we account for the, uh, the dilution due to the redshift, 
and uh, and then we divide by the critical density and we get this uh, expression. And we can see that it scales as the fermion mass times the uh, beta squared over capita the three halves. And so we can make a, a plot in the uh, in the kappa beta parameter space. And that's shown by these lines for two different fermion masses. Um, and so uh, all along this region, we could get the right uh, dark matter relic density. Okay. Um, now let's go into region two. And in region two, uh, here we're at in, in a region where Y oscillation is less than one. Uh, so this corresponds to small values of beta and small values of kappa. And, um, and so now um, uh, what happens is that the, since the oscillation temperature is less than one, we, we, can't, we can no longer just use this expression. We have to actually, we have to actually follow what the evolution happens uh, to, smaller, to lower temperatures. So what happens is that at, at y equals one, the fermions become Boltzmann suppressed. And so the, the slope basically vanishes. And so the trajectory just kind of asymptotes to this uh, constant value, uh, which is of order beta. And so then you can just uh, estimate the oscillation uh, temperature from there, uh, oscillation amplitude from, that, from there. And again, you can compute the relic density and you, and you see that it scales like beta squared, uh, squared of kappa. Okay, and then so uh, if you plot that, uh, parametric curve, you, you find that it looks uh, like this. And you can try to extrapolate into the intermediate regime. You can also try to just solve it numerically by uh, evolving the equation of motion. And uh, you find actually that the agreement is quite good. OK, okay so um, in summary, then, uh, you know, for this generic toy model, we can uh, achieve the right relic density over uh, a, a broad range of parameter space. Um, now, let me make a couple of comments about uh, the initial conditions and how that might be affected by inflation. So during inflation, the evolution of the dark matter scalar field involves a competition between uh, classical rolling and quantum fluctuations. Um, given a long enough period of inflation, the distribution of the scalar field will approach a Gaussian with a mean that's close to zero and a variance that's given by the a Hubble parameter to the fourth power during inflation divided by the scalar mass squared. And so um, what we need for our mechanism essentially is that it, if, if we wanna uh, have a viable me me mechanism without fine tuning of initial conditions, we would like this variance to be smaller than the oscillation amplitude that is predicted by our mechanism. Um, otherwise it we would sort of be starting from a too small of an initial field value. Uh, in, 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 in an, a natural region in some sense. And we also need the reheat temperature to be larger than the oscillation uh, temperature. And you can always um, you can always meet these two conditions uh, for a, a suitable range of the value of the Hubble parameter uh, and, and, a, and a long enough period of inflation. And um, these two features also tend to suppress uh, primordial scalar dark matter fluctuations. Uh, and, and so you can also evade isocurvature iso constraints in that way. Okay, so um, now let me discuss uh, uh, a more realistic example model where I take the fermion to be the muon. Um, why the muon? There's not really any particularly good reason. Uh, we also consider the electron, for example. Um, it turns out that the electron model is already quite constrained. Uh, and so, Next, next one we tried is the muon. But there's really, a, there's really quite a, a variety of uh, different couplings that you could imagine. And, uh, and this is just one uh, example to show sort of a proof of principle, uh, not, not necessarily uh, particularly motivated by any, any, uh, any experiment or any anomaly or anything like that, just an example. OK, so, um, so this, uh, you can obtain this, this coupling from uh, some dimension five operator. Um, uh, you could imagine UV completing this in various ways. Um, at, at temperatures above the electroweak scale, the Higgs uh, essentially is nailed at zero. And so the fermion mass turns off, the fermion feedback turns off essentially. And, um, and then once the electric symmetry is broken, the fermion feedback will turn on, the, the, the effective potential will then develop. Um, in this, uh, with this coupling, there can be a, a correction to the scalar mass. Um, uh, so you can, you can close the, the fermion loop 
and then you'll have a phi squared h squared operator and then when the h h gets a, a vev uh can it can generate a mass okay so this is this is nothing more than uh just what we discussed with the, the coleman weinberg uh, one loop potential so I'll, I'll just indicate where this uh, scalar potential would be fine-tuned in the parameter space and and then we can just uh, apply the previous results by uh, essentially fixing the fermion mass to be the muon mass Okay, so that looks like this. I'm plotting the scalar mass versus the coupling beta. And um, uh, along this line, we have omega phi equal to omega dark matter. Um, this is the, the line uh, that I drew from the naturalness condition, just the sort of demanding that the, the scalar mass is not tuned. So everything to the left of this would, be, would correspond to a tuning, everything to the right of this uh, would what you could say is natural from that point of view. So we see there is some parameter space here where uh, um, you're not having to tune the scalar mass. Okay, let me discuss a few of the possible experimental probes of this scenario. So the first one, and I'll, I'll just organize this discussion by uh, what coupling the dark matter, uh, what coupling this relies on of the dark matter. So uh, the first class of constraints come from just the gravitational interaction of dark matter that apply essentially to uh, generically to ultralight uh, bosonic dark matter. So um, so one class of constraints are the Lyman alpha, or you could say fuzzy dark matter constraints. Uh, in this regime where the dark matter mass is of order 10 to the minus 21 electron volts, uh, or the de Borey wavelength is uh, kiloparsec, matter power at small scales is suppressed. And uh, perhaps the best probe of uh, the matter power spectrum is at, at those scales is the Lyman alpha force flux uh, power spectrum. And so uh, this has been studied on a number of occasions and uh, abound from this study uh, by, by Ersik at all uh, find that scalar mass should be greater than about 10 to the minus 21 electron volts. So that's this gray region. Um, another effect or constraint that comes just from the gravitational coupling uh, is due to the black hole super radiance effect. And so here the idea is that light bosons with Compton wavelength of order the size of the spinning black hole will extract angular momentum through the super radiance effect. Uh, the fact that we see uh, such spinning black holes or x-ray binaries in this, in this particular case uh, constrain light bosons then. And so uh, uh, the super radiance provides the strongest constraints uh, for scalar masses of order 10 to the minus 12 electron volts, as I'm showing here. And, um, and so this can also probe a, a, an interesting region of parameter space. Okay, now um, let me talk about probes that couple that, that rely directly on the coupling to the muon, which is interesting because that, that's the coupling that's controlling the relic density. So one uh, possibility is to look at muon storage ring experiments. So, so experiments that try to measure G minus two of the muon. And so the idea here is that dark matter coupling to muons will induce an oscillating muon mass. And so it can alter the muon precession frequency in storage ring experiments. Uh, so that's shown kind of by this equation, there'll be a shift in the, uh, the precession frequency uh, that is controlled by the, the dark matter um, oscillating energy density uh, or oscillating uh, field value. And, um, and so this has been studied uh, by Janish and Ramani and they put some constraints by studying the Brookhaven uh, experiment. So that's shown here. Um, uh, a time resolve analysis would be uh, even better. So you could, you could detect uh, individual you know, specific time variations um, due to the oscillating uh, dark matter field. And again, this probes uh, the dark matter coupling to me. So it's not, it's not quite strong enough to get down into the interesting region from relic density, but uh, still is an interesting uh, experimental probe. Um, another probe that relies on the dark matter coupling to muon can come from neutron study of neutron star binaries. Uh, and so here neutron stars are muon rich environments uh, and the properties of these neutron star binaries can be modified if there is a long range muonic force. And there's sort of two effects that uh, one can imagine. Um, the pulsar binary systems could exhibit uh, a different pattern in their decay so they could decay anomalously fast by uh, essentially emitting these muonic force carriers. Um, as well, you could also, in, in, in merging neutron star, neutron star binaries, you could also have a long range 
muonic force that uh, modifies the in-spiral pattern. And that could be detected or inferred through the, the resulting pattern of gravitational radiation. And so this has been studied by Dror et al. Uh, and I'm showing here uh, two, two constraints. So one is uh, from uh, existing constraints from binary pulsar um, um, studies of the orbital periods. And then this is a projection uh, for neutron star, neutron star merger uh, from, um, from studies of gravitational waves. Okay. Um, another set of probes comes from the equivalence principle. And uh, so the basic idea is here, here is that if you couple to the muon, you're eventually going to couple to photons uh, and, and electrons and protons and, and matter in general. Um, this will induce a long range uh, Yukawa force. Um, it, will be it will be composition uh, dependent, so it will depend on the particular uh, you know, uh, attractor that you're looking at. And so there can be equivalence principle tests. And so that's shown uh, by the orange line here. And that probes uh, both the low mass region as well as the high mass uh, region. A parameter space. And then another interesting set of probes comes from studies, uh, uh, systems that can detect variation, uh, temporal variation of the fine structure constant. So at one loop, the dark matter couples to photons. This leads to a, a time varying fine structure constant. And so there already are strong limits from atomic clocks. Uh, that's indicated by this line here. And then uh, future atom interferometry and atom inter interferometry experiments can also uh, provide a powerful probe of uh, temporal variations of uh, uh, the fine structure constant due to the dark matter background. Okay, so a couple of uh, projections are shown here. Okay, so putting everything together, we have this uh, parameter space. Um, and so there's, it's a, it's a pretty interesting parameter space. There's a wide range of different experimental and observational probes. Uh, uh, there are some potential from uh, particularly from uh, atomic clocks and atom interferometry experiments to probe new regions of parameter space. Some new ideas are, are needed over here. Uh, how can we dig into this parameter space in this model? Um, but, but in general, it's a, it's a pretty rich uh, and interesting scenario. Uh, and there's a tight correlation and a, a, a firm target for experiments to, to try to go after. So this, these blue lines are where the, the relic density are. Uh, you can get the right relic density. All right, so um, I'll, I'll basically stop there and conclude. So ultralight bosons represent a well-motivated uh, class of dark matter models. And I've discussed the, our thermal misalignment mechanism. Uh, it's a, a mechanism which relies on a coupling of the scalar dark matter to uh, fermions in, the, in thermal equilibrium uh, that results in a finite temperature potential. Uh, this drives the scalar field towards large field values in the initial uh, stages of the evolution, uh, generating misalignment. And we studied a specific case where the scalar field couples to the muon. Um, and it's a, it's a realistic scenario. And there's a variety of uh, interesting opportunities uh, to potentially probe this scenario. And um, I think this idea, though, is, is certainly more general. And uh, there's, there's certainly some room for uh, future work, which we're exploring. OK, I'll stop there and uh, happy to take questions. Oh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Now, the session is open for the uh, question and discussions. Yes, please, Kiyun. OK. Hi, Brian. OK. Hi, Kiyun. Thank you. Thank you for a nice talk. And <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Uh, I have just one question about this. Uh, your naturalist estimate, estimate on your dark matter mass for your, this yeah. particular you know, model, which couples to the muons. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's true that the uh, at the one loop, you know, one loop Coleman Einberg potential. That I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you here showed you you showed only the uh, one loop correction to the dark matter mass from Coleman Einberg potentials, but I think in your case, so effectively for one loop diagram, you know, the the contribution to dark matter mass squared is effective cut off at weak scale. Yeah. Right, but but if you consider you know higher loops, for instance two loops, you will get the uh, quadratic divergent contribution to the dark matter mass scale with cutoff scale around the gut scale or Planck scale, which right. should be much much bigger than the your own yeah. contribution. Right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah, that good. I guess that the I, I'm not sure if this your naturalist estimation is correct one. Yeah, or... I, I can. I, yeah, I I understand exactly what you're saying. So you're right at two uh, at two loops. 
um, uh, I could take this operator and I could close the Fermion loop and I can also close the Higgs loop. And I, that's I, right. I, yes. Quadratic term. So, yes. um, so our assumption is, is we're trying to say like, okay, what's the most conservative natural bound we, naturalness bound we could put? Uh, and, you know, so you could imagine maybe UV completing this at the weak scale uh, and maybe putting in something like supersymmetry, which shields you from, you know, uh, physics at the gut scale. So it, we're cut, yeah, we're, so we would be assuming that, that that quadratic divergence is also cut off at the weak scale. Uh, and then, and then you would get a similar the supersymmetry is useful. I mean, the, in, in your case, maybe supersymmetry doesn't help, may not be helpful, but okay. Yeah, and yeah, I don't, yeah, so I, I, I agree. I, I, I don't have a, I don't have a, um, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure if supersymmetry work, but uh, I, I guess the assumption is just that perhaps there could be some new physics at the weak scale, which, um, which shields this light scalar from, you know, uh, new physics corrections from the deep UV. Okay. Uh, that's my assumption, but yeah, you know, one could certainly try to critique that. So if, if you buy that though, then uh, this, 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 this two loop estimate would give you something that's comparable or maybe even a little bit weaker than this, this one that I've, that I've written here. Okay. Yeah. Good question though. Hi, hi, Brian. Hi, Unjin. Good to see you. Yeah. So it's nice that you collected all the experimental bound. Shall we go to page 54? So here is for muon and phi coupling. Right. So I was wondering what happens if it comes to electron phi or the yeah. uh, UMD quark and phi. Yeah. Um, I, I have to remind myself, but we, we did look and we didn't, we looked at the electron coupling. And what we found, I think, was that um, in the region where you get the right relic density, uh, there already are pretty strong constraints, even from like equivalence principle. Mm. Um, so it wasn't clear to us that that would be a phenomenologically viable scenario. Uh, but we're still, we're still studying that coupling as well as some others. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't have much to say, but um, yeah, I, I think that this is just one example that we found was uh, you know, pretty interesting and viable, um, but yeah, certainly Yeah, actually I other... can guess it, yeah. yeah so for quark, quark coupling would be constant further, right? Um, yeah, well, quark coupling is interesting because then you, I think you need to think carefully about the QCD phase transition. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because at you know in the early universe at, at very high temperatures, then you're in you're you're in the essentially the free free phase, uh, and then and then there's the QCD phase transition that can so that can affect the dynamics of the scalar field. So um, that's so that's right. something I think that is, is still worth uh, looking into. But um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly. Um, yeah, actually, I was also mumbling about that, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's this this okay, case okay. of coupling the laptop. Uh, anyway, I mean, the, uh, this uh, the the bound from uh, fifth force would be much stronger for quarks, right? Yeah, it could. It also, could NS, well NS bound yeah. as well. You would expect it to be. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yep. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a question, Brian. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in this last in this plot, you have a quarty and quadratic. What is this right. mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the quadratic is just the naturalness bound that I drew earlier. Um, you can also have a correction to the quartic coupling, and um, and so you also would need to essentially tune that away. And because if you have a quartic coupling dominating, then it, the scalar field will not behave like dark matter anymore. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have the right um, scaling with red with redshift. It. it uh, so, so above this line, you, you're also essentially have to uh, implicitly assuming that that quartic coupling is small. So it's also a type of naturalness uh, consideration, I would I say. See, I, I see, I see. Correction to the quartic. Oh, yep. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, actually, I wanted to clarify the uh, Munich muon storage ring bound. I, I just, uh, I want to understand, uh, is, this, is this due to the muon, uh, I mean, oscillating muon mass or what is this? Yes, yeah, yeah. So you can see if, so this is the expression for the, um, uh, for the, uh, the uh, precession frequency. And you mm -hmm. see it depends on the muon mass. Mm -hmm. 
And so now if the muon, if you couple the muon to the scalar field, then the muon mass will oscillate. And so you get a correction to the precession frequency, which is shown here. Ah, I see. Okay. Then uh, you can, uh, from the muon G minus two, uh, so you can put a bound on that. Uh, right, right. Uh, this BNL is the... Yeah, that, the BNL is that, it, uh, I see, I see. that region. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comment? Uh, if not, let's thank the Brian again, and let's move to the next talk. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, can I share my screen? All right. Oops. Okay. Mm. All right, does it work? Yeah, I can see this slide. So uh, next speaker is Professor So Dong Shin from Jeonbuk National University, and he'll talk about hidden dynamics of a subcomponent dark matter. Please. All right, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, the, this talk is based on my recent work with uh, Ike Kanada, he's from Kim and Jeongjo Park, uh, which, uh, which has shown up uh, in last November. And uh, probably I can skip the, the introduction part of dark matter, but the, the point is uh, what we are, all of us are interested in is what particle is dark matter. And uh, the, which actually can be identified as, as its mass or what kind of inter non-gravitational interactions it, uh, uh, they have. The non-gravitational interactions can be categorized as the, uh, dark, uh, the, the interactions between the dark matter and the standard model sector or the dark matter uh, sector themselves. Especially the interaction, non-gravitational interactions between uh, dark matter and the standard model sector are really important, important in uh, explaining the observed uh, result of, of the relic of this. And, and also uh, uh, the, the uh, observational results in terms of indirect detection or direct detection experiments. Of course, preferred candidate so far was weakly interacting massive particle. So I'm gonna skip this, but the WIMP has been focused on so far a lot because of a theoretical reason, because many PSM theories motivated from resolving cage hierarchy problem could uh, naturally have, uh, have a, a WIMP particle as a dark matter candidate. Of course, as you all know, the WIMP are strongly constrained from various experiments, including the collider experiments, direct direction experiments, and indirect direction experiments. Here are the examples of, uh, of uh, various bounds coming from the uh, direct detection experiments. Okay, we can we can still uh, look for the WIMP signal more because WIMP is not uh, strongly defined. It is uh, it is quite loosely defined. So even the uh, not not excluded reason can can be primary reason of uh, we go in right massive particle in various theories of uh, new physics theories beyond the beyond standard model. And uh, however. We may can be a theoretical bias. So in terms of a lot, all the around reason uh, for the dark matter, uh, in terms of mass of dark matter and the interactions with the standard model sector, the we may uh, take a very small, a small part, okay? So it only takes a small reason. And if we compare it to the uh, standard model sector, whose relic abundance is, uh, whose relic abundance is, uh, is like a, just 20% a of the dark matter. Uh, the, the standard model has uh, 17 uh, particles and has uh, like a three, three types of interactions. So maybe we may be a, a too much simplification. So I often compare this situation with, uh, with the old map of Korea, like it is, it is old map of Korea in uh, 1402. As you can see here, Korea is really huge. And of course, China is huge. And even, uh, and, uh, even Japan is very small and the Europe is very small. Africa is very small, which is, which is uh, different from the real world, right? So therefore the dark matter theories with novel dark sector structures beyond the have been actively uh, uh, proposed nowadays. And uh, out of them, the multiple dark matter components are considered in a variety of uh, dark sector theories beyond the uh, For example, like a multi-component boosted dark matter, which I'm gonna uh, talk about later, and the composite dark matter, which was discussed by Hitoshi. 
on Tuesday. Or some, some other models as well. Oh, conventionally, uh, among those uh, multi-component dark matter, uh, there are some some dominant uh, components. Uh, I mean, the, there are some dark matter components which can take the, which can take the dominant uh, uh, relative elements. However, there are, there might be some subcomponent dark matter, and conventionally, subcomponent dark matter components are thought to be hidden in direct and di indirect detection experiments, because uh, as you can see here, like uh, if we uh, uh, have a direct detection or indirect detection experiment, it is proportional to the the number density of, of the dark matter. If the dark matter is a subcomponent it's, uh, and it's, if its fraction is very small, then the observables related with the direct detection and indirect detection experiments are suppressed uh, uh, with, uh, with the interfraction. And uh, this kind of situation is, was a uh, conventional situation was particularly useful in the scenarios where the dominant rally communicates with the standard model sector to the subdominant rally. But the question is, it actually depends on uh, how the amount of subdominant rally is determined. For example, if uh, dark matter and, uh, and the standard model coupling both contributes to the uh, to the amount of uh, uh, the relic of subdominant uh, dark matter and the cross section, which is relevant for observing the signals in direct detection and indirect detection experiments, somehow since observable is a fraction of the subdominant uh, relic times cross section. Uh, this uh, uh, small fraction can be canceled out in uh, in in the final uh, final result. As a concrete example, we brought up the uh, the models of multi-component boosted dark matter. The multi-component boosted dark matter looks like this. There are, there is a heavy dark matter component and a light dark matter component. The heavy dark matter component interacts with the standard model particles only through the light dark matter components. Uh, after imposing some sort of product symmetry, like a UN, uh, UN product U1 by U1 or Z2 by Z. And uh, uh, the annihilation process between uh, of the uh, heavy dark matter into the light dark matter pair uh, freezes up first and takes the most of the, and, the, uh, and then the, uh, light, the annihilation process of the light dark matter into standard motor sector freezes out later. By doing this mechanism called the assistant freeze out mechanism, the most of the relic is given by this heavy dark matter, which I'm going to call chi zero, and the abundance relic abundance of light dark matter, which I'm going to call chi one, is very small. So this chi one is subdominant dark matter, and in this mechanism, uh, multi component in this multi component boosted dark matter, this um, uh, most of the relic, which is the heavy dark matter, is sequestered from the standard motor sector. and this heavy dark matter uh, can be accumulated. In the in the uh, in some point of, of our universe with uh, huge gravitational potential, such as galactic center, sun, or dwarf sphere of the galaxies, depending on some models. And the accumulated heavy dark matter pair can be annihilated into light dark matter. And because of the mass difference between the heavy dark matter and the light dark matter, this produced light dark matter can have relativistic, relativistic kinetic energy. And we can observe this uh, relativistically scattering uh, light dark matter uh, with uh, after some target in various experiments whose uh, threshold energy is low enough uh, below the uh, relativistic energy of this uh, light uh, dark matter. So that's why it is called the boosted light dark matter. So in terms of, uh, in the point of view of uh, heavy dark matter, it's uh, nothing but the indirect detection of heavy dark matter component, which is the dominant value. Uh, since it just looks like the uh, annihilation into neutrino, the flux of light dark matter is determined by the annihilation cross section of the heavy dark matter pair into light dark matter times the uh, number density square, uh, square of the number density of the heavy dark matter, which is, in other words, uh, inversely proportional to the square of the mass of heavy dark matter. And uh, the, if the mass of heavy dark matter is around like 100 GB, which is uh, expected the mass range of mean, then the, the flux is like a uh, about 10 to minus eight inverse square centimeter per second, which corresponds to the, uh, the, the flux, uh, 10,000 uh, 10, times smaller than the flux of the Mmos brain neutrino. So in this case, we uh, use uh, various nutrient experiments, including neon hypercomic and supercomic and to observe the signal of a boosted dark matter. And since it's flux of boosted dark matter is also proportional, uh, inversely proportional to the square of mass of heavy dark matter, if the mass of heavy dark matter is below like a one GV or sub GV range, 
then we can utilize the various uh, tone scale direct detection experiments since the flux increases a lot. For the neutron experiments, Super Kamiokande has already started the search for new pussy dark matter in 2018, uh, follow, uh, followed by the Dune experiments, which will start at, uh, in 20, 20, uh, 2026. And this, uh, I copied some, some section related with the search for pussy dark matter in the Dune TDR. And uh, it is COS 900 experiment who jumped into the search for the uh, boosted dark matter. Specifically, uh, this, is pa this paper is for the search for inelastic boosted dark matter based on, uh, on the model proposed by myself and my collaborators here. And uh, in 2020, uh, the Xenon went on announced the, the uh, high energy recoil electron, recoil electron signals, which can be also uh, explained in terms of boosted dark matter. And so far, we have focused on the signals coming from this channel, okay? Coming from the annihilation of heavy dark matter, which is the, which is the dominant relic, into the light dark matter pair. And we have ignored the effect of negligible uh, relic, uh, direct uh, observation of uh, negligible relic uh, light dark matter, which is conventionally accepted in multi-component dark matter models which, uh, as I as I mentioned before, and now let us move our focus to the structure of subdominant and light dark matter chi one, and uh, and this interaction between the light dark matter and the standard model sectors, and their effects to cosmological and astro astrophysical observables. To discuss more about that, uh, let me. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, how how we, uh, the, about the Boltzmann equations to determine the relic. The Boltzmann equations uh, determining the relic of uh, heavy dark matter and the light dark matter uh, look like this. For the light dark matter, the amount of light dark matter is determined both from the interactions between uh, between the light dark matter and the standard model sector, and the interactions between the heavy dark matter and the standard model. Uh, excuse me, uh, light dark matter sector. Okay, like this. And after the heavy dark matter component uh, Kaiser phases out, I can write down the Boltzmann equation of, of uh, light dark matter like this. And uh, there, is, uh, there is a part which is contributed from the uh, residual annihilation of uh, heavy dark matter pair into light dark matter for a while. And I'm gonna call this contribution as uh, Y assisted, uh, co-moving number density assisted, which is, uh, uh, Proportional to the square root of the uh, annihilation cross section, uh, the ratio of the annihilation cross section of heavy, of heavy dark matter pair into light dark matter divided by the annihilation cross section of light dark matter into standard mode sector. And the fraction of light dark matter is determined as, as like this, right? And uh, the, during the decoupling, we, I also assume that light dark matter is in kinetic equilibrium with, with the standard mode sector. If this assisted y, y assisted is negligible. It just looks like the conventional uh, conventional rim, uh, uh, just like the so like rim. This light dark matter freezes out at the temperature uh, about uh, about like uh, the one twenty of its mass as usual, right? But uh, however, if the fraction of light dark matter is very small, which means which means that the interactions, uh, the interaction coupling between the light dark matter into the standard model sector should be very high, which means this annihilation cross-section uh, can, uh, can, uh, 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 can, be, can, be, uh, can be very large, right? So uh, in that case, the y assist uh, can be non negligible And uh, when the light dark matter pair into standard model sector is dominated by the S-ray, uh, the uh, the commuting number density is expected like this. Evolution of commuting number density is expected like this. If the ratio, the fraction of light dark matter is about 10% of the uh, the total relic uh, in the left panel. In the right panel, we show the case that the, if the, uh, the ratio is 70%. And this thin blue line corresponds to the commuting num uh, number density expected with uh, ignoring the assisted y assist. Which means for the, when the fraction of this light dark matter is, is, uh, is small, like if it is like as small as 10% of below it, then the commoving number density of chi one light dark matter is lifted up by 
uh, assisted uh, wire assisted. And it follows the wire, uh, wire assisted uh, when the uh, temperature is below like a one third of, of the mass of, of light dark matter. And here in this diagram, this uh, uh, purple line uh, shows the, denotes the, uh, the, the evolution of wire assisted as temperature drops down. And the annihilation cross section of a heavy dark matter pair into a standard water sector increases as one over r one square. So it is inversely, is inversely proportional to the square of the fraction of a light dark matter. Okay, so which means uh, it can be cast out in various cosmological and astrophysical observables. Okay, and when the light dark matter annihilation. Uh, process into standard water sector is dominated by P wave, one might naively expect that because it is P wave suppressed, then uh, we can, uh, the all the parameters will be safe from the constraints. But this is not the case. As you can see here, the convenient number density of light dark matter is again affected by the uh, wire system. So when the fraction of light dark matter is 10%, for example, which is much smaller than one, then the, it is even lifted by uh, wire state a lot uh, until like uh, the temperature is uh, one eighty of, of the mass of, of light dark matter. However, you can see here on the right panel, if the, the light dark matter is dominant, if it, is, it takes like 70% of the observability, uh, this situation never happens, right? And the annihilation cross section of uh, light dark matter pair into a standard motor sector increases as a, cubic of uh, 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 inversely proportional to the cubic of a uh, fraction of light dark matter. So uh, the process can be also sensitive to various observables. So, so when the, uh, as, as we saw here, that when the fraction of light dark matter is, is small, much smaller than one, like if it is, uh, the, this example is when the, uh, when the fraction is 10%, the convolving number density Evolution of convenient number density of light dark matter is lifted up by wire assisted. Therefore, uh, and, and uh, the light dark matter pair into standard motor sector because it's annihilation cross section is inversely proportional to the fraction of light dark matter, either square or the or cubic. It affects the uh, cosmology, various cosmological and astrophysical observables. Now, for the P wave dominant case, uh, the light dark matter pair into standard motor sector takes a less low. In determining the uh, the uh, uh, this uh, convenient number density of light dark matter than the S wave, so we call this kind of past, uh, the primary reason as a assisted reason. And uh, when the uh, fraction of light dark matter is dominant, uh, and this if it is at least larger than fifty percent, then the convenient number density of light dark matter is not affected by Y assisted anymore. Okay, so it just follows what is expected uh, as we expected in. in so we call this primary region as standard region. So as we, we can conclude that sub, subdominant dark matter can be not hidden and affect various observables like uh, various uh, 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 phenomena uh, in the Big Bang, uh, the effect of, uh, sorry, induced by Big Bang nuclear physics, including photo dissociation of light elements. And if the, uh, if the Light dark matter annihilation process into standard water sector freezes out after the neutrino decoupling temperature, uh, below the neutrino decoupling temperature, it can also affect the primordial elements, of abundance of primordial elements. And it can also affect the cosmic microwave background uh, observation as well, because light dark matter pairing into standard water sector can inject energy after less scary. And the effective, there, we can also uh, consider the N effective constraints if, if it uh, freezes out after the neutrino decoupling. And the subdominant dark matter pair into standard number sector can be also constrained from diffuse X-rays or gamma rays observations in Milky Way. And if we allow the crossing symmetry between the annihilation and the, and the conventional T-channel uh, diagram in the direct detection experiments, then we can, uh, we can also uh, consider the direct detection experiments to constrain the parameter region of subdominant dark matter. If uh, light dark matter annihilation into standard water sector is dominated by S wave, of course, as you can see here, almost all the primary regions are constrained by various experiments. 
So like uh, this is a different situation well, uh, as we expected in uh, conventional model. The, the cosmological and astrophysical bounds on light dark matter annihilations are very strange right? because of the inestimable number density conventionally. But uh, conventionally, the existence of subdominant dark matter annihilation channel into standard water sector like our structure has been naively thought as remedy because, uh, because uh, 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 naively, uh, the long term think that the observable is proportional to the, uh, uh, the, the ratio, uh, the fraction of light dark matter. However, as we have uh, clarified here, the observables no longer depend on uh, the fraction of light dark matter in, in our scenario, right? So that's why uh, we, are, uh, we are strongly constrained by, uh, by various observables, including direct detection experiments if we allow the uh, crossing symmetries in fact. So in this kind of structure, we can just forget about the S wave annihilation. S wave annihilation is constrained a lot. If we move on to uh, the P wave annihilation, however, there might be some, some open parameter space because uh, there is still like a P wave, uh, P -wave suppression. But the thing is uh, the, the P wave suppression should uh, compete with the enhancement of uh, by the fraction of uh, light dark matter compared to the total of the relic. And the parameter space is robustly constrained by N effective and the dark matter direct detection experiments assuming the crossing symmetry is effective. And uh, one thing we, sh we should also uh, think about is uh, even though the, the, uh, this two body P wave is dominant at some point, it is possible in a later time, this four body S wave can take over uh, this two body P wave processes. In that case, another constraint coming from CMB and the, and the diffuse gamma ray and the X rays coming to, uh, uh, to, uh, coming to, to constrain the uh, prominent spaces of light dark matter. And actually, uh, furthermore, this depends on the evolution of the temperature of uh, light dark matter. Now let, uh, let me discuss about the, uh, the evolution of the temperature of light dark matter. And the, there, there can be self-interaction between the light dark matter. The self-interactive dark matter models have been proposed actively recently. And the self -inter basically self-interactions -inter always exist in any kind of dark matter model. The question is how efficient they are, how efficient they can transfer energy long after the freeze out, which is not effective for wind. And the self-interactions of sub dark matter uh, chiron can be large for order one dark, uh, dark, uh, dark sector coupling. So we need a large coupling because uh, we want this uh, light dark matter subdominant, which means we need a very huge coupling uh, to increase the uh, annihilation cross section between the light dark matter and the standard water sector. And the, in the, in the multi-component boosted dark matter scenario, the heavy dark matter pair can annihilate into light dark matter producing boosted, which is energetic light dark matter, which means light dark matter has energies. And through the self interactions between the light dark matters, it can transfer its energy to the, to the other, other uh, code relics of light dark matter. So this is called the self heating mechanism of a light dark matter. And this kind of self heating mechanisms have been, uh, mechanisms have been uh, already uh, proposed by in the previous literatures, including the paper by my collaborators. This is how it looks like uh, of the, uh, uh, how the temperature evolution of, of uh, light dark matter pair looks like, uh, light dark matter looks like after considering the uh, surface heating mechanism. So surface heating can increase the temperature of a light dark matter even, uh, uh, in, a, even in, the, uh, in, the, the, in the time of photo dissociation. So if surface heating is efficient, even after the kinetic decoupling, the temperature evolution of uh, light dark matter shows an interest in dynamics. The effect increases as one of its fraction, right? If the fraction of light dark matter uh, compared to the total absorbed relic is gets smaller, then the temperature uh, uh, goes up, right? And uh, it also, uh, the, the defect is also large when the strength of surface interaction is large. And in this case, photo dissociation bounds become severe, okay? When the fraction of, uh, even when the fraction of light, uh, light dark matter is 10% uh, or below. 
And if the uh, fraction of light dark matter is around 10% or slightly larger than that, then self-heating epoch can persist even until the matter radiation cold, which affects the structure formation. So the, this light dark matter can, even though this light dark matter can have mass uh, around like a 10 MeV, this can be warm dark matter, which is uh, whose mass is uh, uh, much larger than the conventional warm dark matter. So the, the, we got to consider the various bounds for the warm dark matter, including Lyman alpha or number of satellites. So regarding those, uh, uh, those warm dark matter bounds, there are additional constraints in the, uh, in the parameter space of uh, light dark matter. And the warm dark matter constraint enters when the fraction of light dark matter is uh, larger than 7% uh, of the total absorbed relic. And it, uh, we, we still have the constraint coming from the warm dark matter, even when uh, light dark matter mass is around 40 MD. And uh, direct detection bounds get weakened because of its warmness, slightly weakened because of its warmness. We can also uh, proceed some complementary searches in various cell layers, right? As you can see here, there are some bounds coming from Babar or some B Factory uh, and the NS684. And uh, the, here we consider the reference model with a single scale is dark matter and the mediated is dark photon. So the annihilation channel into the, uh, of this uh, light dark matter into the standard receptor is P wave. And the green shaded region, uh, the green shaded region is already excluded by various accelerators. And the green shaded regions are, are excluded by N effective. And pink shaded region is excluded by warm dark matter region. Uh, and which is especially effective when the fraction of uh, warm dark matter is larger than 10% or around 10%. When the uh, fraction of the light dark matter is below like 10%, then uh, usually a cellular re uh, results, uh, the bounds coming from the cellular results uh, are get stronger because it uh, requires a large copy. And more, furthermore, uh, future discovery, assuming that we have discovered some signal of light dark matter in a cell right here, then this feature discovery can tell the dark matter structure in more detail. For example, let's assume that we have discovered the signal here. And this blue line is what is expected for the, uh, 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 expected for the uh, light dark matter, assuming that it takes the 100% relic. Then we can say that uh, this is a subdominant uh, dark matter. However, uh, uh, subdominant dark matter. And however, uh, this subdominant dark matter cannot be in a dark sector theories uh, in, in, the, in the dark sector structures like the multi-component positive dark matter because it is already constrained by one dark matter, uh, one dark matter constraints. So here are my conclusions. A subdominant component dark matter can severely affect the cosmological and astrophysical observable rules, and uh, which is uh, uh, not expected in conventional scenarios. Uh, not expected conventionally. And the uh, light dark matter interaction between the standard and receptor, uh, the, the P wave is preferred. The surface heating uh, between this light dark matter can naturally arise in a wide range of parameter space and change the evolution of temperature of light dark matter after the freeze out. The subdominant can affect the structure formation and the uh, sub GV mass warm dark matter, which is uh, heavy warm dark matter. Especially when the fraction of light dark matter is uh, around or above like a 10%. And the complementary sources in accelerators, accelerators are possible and they dis disfavor the, uh, the fraction of uh, light dark matter below like 10%. Okay, thank you. And I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, now the time is for question and co uh, comment from the audience. I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, you said that there's a bound from N effective uh, for the subcomponent dark matter. Uh, yes. You said because the subcomponent dark matter become still relativistic during BBN, or how does it? Uh, how do you get that bound? And no, can... no, like a, so it's like a subcomponent of dark matter can annihilate into standard model particles such as E plus E minus or photos, right? Mm -hmm. So it can provide extra entropy so that it can change mm -hmm. the temperature of, of, of photos, right? Mm -hmm. 
so that the, the ineffective relies on the temperature ratio of the neutrino and, and, and the photon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for fourth power of temperature ratio, so, so that it can change the expected entropy. Okay, I see. So this is this is uh, conventionally so, so uh, conventionally uh, the the bound from the n effective is com conventional uh, usually applied to any kind of light dark matter models, a light dark matter which can analyze into uh, very light standard models. Particles. Any other question? Comment? Yeah. So don't uh, can you clarify the last two conclusions you made? So R one is less than ten percent is helpful for a self component. And disfavor by the uh, accelerator. What was why? Well, so I can I can say that I can say that the when the fraction is below ten percent, it is mostly disfavored by various experiments like this. Mm -hmm. Like uh, so, of course, it depends on the model. But for this specific reference models, we need we need uh, uh, couplings. Uh, this is a kinetic uh, kinetic mixing parameter square. And the, the, this is a kinetic mixing parameter is around like a, a 10, uh, uh, 10 to 3. And uh, if the kinetic mixing parameter is, is below 10 to 3, then the annihilation process of, of light dark matter pair into standard model sector is, in, is gets in, more ineffective, which means it's a fraction gets increasing. Mm -hmm. So to have a small fraction, we need a huge couple. So does it mean it doesn't uh, contribute to the, uh, the large scale Larger scale astrophysical observa observables. No, I don't get your point. So, so are you saying as uh, is your question? Uh, the, the when the yeah, fraction if, of light dark matter is more than ten percent, it doesn't contribute to any cosmological or astrophysical observations or something. Uh, it doesn't contribute I, to the. I'm actually confused. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So to help the um, structure formation and so on, I, I think you need certain amount of R one. Right. So, like, uh, to uh, to be constrained from the warm dark matter, the fraction of a uh, fraction of light dark matter should be larger than seven percent, around seven percent, mm -hmm. or, or ten percent. That's uh, that's because uh, it is constrained by the gene gene length, it's cosmological mm -hmm. perturbation scale. So, it is uh, inversely proportional to the ratio of uh, the, the fraction of light dark matter. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, the the but uh, if the fraction of light dark matter is below like seven percent, if it is like say like a one percent. Then the, it doesn't it doesn't affect the uh, so it doesn't make the one dark uh, it is not constrained from the one dark matter constraint mm -hmm. because the cosmological perturbation scale is small it's small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the uh, perspective for the collider uh, accelerator uh, um, uh, experiment in the case when the percentage is uh, like one percent? You mean the expected parameter space here in terms of. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So can, of course it depends he, on a lot. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, please go. On. Of course, it depends on the, the various parameters of dark sectors. Right? It depends or relies on the, the couplings, dark sector gauge couplings. Uh, it, it is a uh, USM dark photon as a mediator. And it depends on the mass of dark matter and the relation between the mediator and the, and the mass. Well, if the fraction, so I don't, I don't remember exactly, but oh, yeah. Maybe I can I can show this diagram instead. Like a fraction is this is when the heavy uh, light dark matter is 10 MeV and the fraction is 10 percent. It looks like this, uh, but, uh, but I don't remember what the uh, what the what the kinetic mixing parameter was. But, but sorry about that. But uh, if the fraction is 10 percent, I think it's just, the the kinetic uh, kinetic mixing parameter should be around like a 10 to 20. For for this uh, for this uh, given reference model and and reference parameter. Okay, yeah, thanks. Oh, any other questions or comments? Uh, okay. So I just realized that the uh, the I was confused about the time when the Brian gave a talk and. I think the, we could have more discussion time for Brian, but the, I move to the next speaker to to uh, kick list. Yeah, you. So if there are some <laughs> questions, I'm I'm very sorry about that, Brian. And uh, 
Uh, so if there are some questions to Brian, please uh, ask him. Sure, sure, I stop share. Stop share my screen. Yeah, I can, I can, I can stop share my screen. Hello? The Brian is still there. Yeah, I'm here. If oh, anyone yeah, yeah, has yeah. questions about my talk. Yeah. So I actually, I had one question which might be related with uh, Kyun's question. Uh, so I think the, you mentioned about this naturalness in the one room level and also the question about two room level, et cetera. But the theory is also operator phi square h dagger h. Yeah, operator. that yeah, that was the one loop uh, operator that Isn't I was it? considering was phi phi squared h squared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would be induced at one loop, and then but the one I think that uh, Q one was mentioning is yeah yeah uh, just phi square, which would be induced at two loop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Okay. Are there any other uh, questions or comment to Brian? Uh, actually, I have a I had a question. Uh, uh, yes. So, so you consider the finite temperature effect uh, due to the coupling uh, for the extra fermion or muon. Uh, my question is the the finite temperature uh, potential uh, can uh, affect the background. Uh, rate uh, radiation or background energy density? I mean, the um, background well, evolution is the sub dominant or? You mean, you, do you mean the, um, the, when, the, the scale fat, like the, the expansion? Yeah, expansion. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we're just assuming basically it's the standard model expansion. So, so it's really the standard model thermal bath mm -hmm. that, we're, that we're imagining. Mm -hmm. um, that this fermion is mm -hmm. coupled to. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I uh, and then the scalar field is so weakly coupled that it doesn't thermalize. Um, and if it did thermalize, it would make our mechanism, uh, it would, would cause our mechanism not to work. So I, I think it's just the standard uh, expansion history. Mm -hmm. So in your case, what's the role of this uh, singlet fermion? Yeah, the singlet fermion. I mean, so we're so the first part of the talk uh, is just saying, okay, suppose you have a generic toy model with you have a fermion coupled to the the bath. It's part of the bath. It's, yeah. It has some interaction. It could be a standard model fermion, or it could be some new fermion that uh, is in thermal equilibrium. So it's just trying to look uh, kind of generally what happens. Mm -hmm. and not being too model specific mm -hmm. and then uh and then we can then we can specialize to a case where the fermion is a standard model particle for example uh, mm -hmm. and that's what we did mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to use it uh for action mr landman mechanism yeah that's a good question um i i uh, I think so. I, I, I mean, I think it would ba basically entail. Um, so, um, yeah, clearly we ha in our scenario, it's not an axion because um, we have this coupling to fermions. So there's no shift symmetry. There's no Petri Quinn symmetry. But I guess you could imagine starting from a Petri, uh, uh, an, a uh, an axion scenario with a Petri Quinn symmetry, and if you broke the Petri Quinn symmetry explicitly, then uh, you could start generating thermal effects like this. And I think people have studied this. In fact, there may have, there may also be, have been a talk by, um, uh, there may have been a talk in this workshop even that maybe discussed some ideas. I'm not, so I haven't, I'm not, I'm not completely sure I'm not, I haven't thought through this case, but I, I think in principle, you could do this. Um, uh, the question would be is is whether you ruin the solution to the strong CP problem by 
inducing mm. this uh, mm. Pechequin breaking effect. Mm. So Brian, Brian, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think I have uh, some different opinions on okay. this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, I would say that you know, if the axion could get the uh, you know sizable finite temperature correction to its potential. I think it's then difficult to call it the axions. Maybe it's just a matter of terminology, but you know, the uh, axion means that you know you have a, some uh, approximate shift symmetry. Right. Shift symmetry should be good enough yep. to, to naturally explain, you know, the, to protect the action right. get heavy mass, right? I agree. So that if uh, that your action satisfies that criterion, then I think uh, you know you, you will be able to use the finite temperature correction to to you know to generate additional. Yeah, summer. I mean, free energy. Yeah, it but could. It could very well course, be. So, yeah. Of course, you know, you 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 break the your Pechequin symmetry badly, then you know you can do anything. But then you lose the natural release, and also I, right. I would not call it action anymore. Just that more, right, right, more right. close to the generic scalar field. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I I don't have any argument with that. I I would just I was just wondering if, you know, you I guess you could imagine inducing introducing a small, uh, a very mild Pechequin breaking. So the, then the question would be, um, can I make it small enough so that you still, that you don't solve the, you don't ruin the solution to the strong CP problem. So in other words, the potential is still dominated by QCD effects, but then at high temperatures, perhaps this could give you some interesting uh, effect on the dynamics. I, I don't know. I'm just, I haven't studied it uh, <laughs> carefully, but maybe I, you're, you I could be right. It's extremely difficult. In any yeah, case, it could be, you could be right. You could be right. problems. And mm -hmm. also just one more remark is that, okay, you mentioned the, the Suji might be helpful. Supersymmetry mm -hmm. might be uh, helpful, but I think still, again, you have the similar problem because the, you know, in supersymmetry models, uh, you know, you need fine tuning if you wish to have any general scalar field lighter than the gravitational mass. Mm -hmm. Because you have to take into account the you know the the, the quantum correction from the Suji breaking sector. Typically, unless your scalar field uh, is protected by a kind of shift symmetry, then usually you get the yep. corrections uh, you know bigger than the gravitational mass. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 So but that's I, why I, don't I suspect make... that Suji is not extremely useful in, in your case. Yeah. It could be. It could be. Uh, so yeah. In in that case, um, you know, I would just say that you know if, if you just this, this could be a, uh, a, a perhaps a challenge to model builders. How can we make a light scaler that? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, of this, course. I mean, you can simply forget about coupling. naturalists. I mean, naturalists is just a kind of, you know, I mean, they're not quite strict the physical uh, requirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I guess I could just say, like, I, I could plausibly imagine, you know, a clever enough model builder could, could imagine, you know, Making a, a light scalar and then maybe the cutoff is at the weak scale. You know, with, I don't know how how much that, gymnastics. That would be extremely, you know, exciting. Yeah. Then that maybe you, you might be able to use that same idea for to solve the weak scale hierarchy problem. Well, so. it, yeah, but this uh, on the other hand, though, this scalar is extremely weakly coupled. Uh, but on the other hand, you you you, you yeah. wish to make your scalar extremely light. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Yeah, indeed, yes. Good okay. point. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for a nice talk, yes. Yeah, thanks for the nice questions. Thank you. So, any other questions or comment? Yeah. If not, uh, let's yeah. thank uh, both speakers in the morning session. And thank you very much, Brian and Sodong. Nice thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. So uh, let's resume the session at, at eleven twenty. Okay. So twenty in twenty five minutes. See you. The recording. So Professor Dr. Ki Hong will talk about the effect of magnetic field on magnetic dipole moments. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, before I start my talk, I, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, especially uh, Hyun Min, uh, for inviting me to this nice workshop to give a talk. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, The Effects of Magnetic Fields on a Magnetic Dipole Moment. Uh, this talk is based upon the work done uh, in collaboration with uh, 
domestic uh, and uh, Erbinia Nera at the APCTP and uh, Kyurin Kim, uh, who, who is my uh, master's degree student and graduating uh, this uh, February. Uh, this is the plan of my talk. After a brief introduction, uh, I will uh, talk about our uh, uh, calculations in QED and QCD. And then uh, I will talk about the uh, effect of uh, reflection due to magnetic field and how we can measure this in Beyond G minus two experiment. And then I will conclude. Uh, as we know, uh, all massive particles with spin are known to have magnetic dipole moment. And here, uh, 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 can you see my uh, 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 arrows? Uh, this, uh, this is my moment and the G is the uh, uh, G factor, E is electric charge, M is the mass, S is the spin. And A measures, A defines the uh, deviation of G factor from the uh, Dirac value, who is two. Uh, and A is uh, called uh, anomalous magnetic moment or uh, magnetic anomaly. The magnetic moment is an in intrinsic quantity of uh, particles. Uh, therefore, it's very important to understand it, to, uh, to understand uh, fundamental uh, uh, laws of uh, physics. Uh, its agreement between theory and the uh, experiment has been a real uh, triumph for uh, quantum field theory since uh, Schrodinger uh, calculated it uh, for the first time, 1951. And currently, uh, electrons, uh, the diaphragm moment is measured at the uh, parts per billion level. The latest data was uh, uh, published by uh, Hanek et al, a Harvard group. And the discrepancy between uh, theory and uh, uh, experiment is 2.4 sigma. Uh, here, uh, Park et al. at Berkeley Group uh, uh, improved the theoretical estimation by improving the value for a uh, fine stretch constant alpha. And uh, the mild moment uh, of elemental particles had served to test the consistency of glacius alam weinberg model uh, when it was uh, uh, established. Uh, uh, Fujikawa, Lee, and San Santa showed uh, it, a GSW model gives uh, a finite sensible result independent of gauge. Uh, currently, uh, the mild moment uh, provides a test, also a hint for the new physics we understand the model. Uh, for instance, for muon, uh, last uh, year, April, uh, Fermilab uh, muon collaboration uh, published their first result show, to show that uh, uh, their result is consistent with the previous uh, BNA result. And combining these two uh, uh, experiments, they obtained uh, 4.2 sigma deviation between theory and uh, experiment. So it might be a, a hint for new physics. So let me uh, talk about how to measure a uh, uh, magnetic moment. It's very simple. Uh, if we apply extra magnetic field, then depending on the uh, uh, magnetic moment or the spin, uh, the energy level splits like this. So by measuring this uh, energy difference between spin uh, up or magnetic moment uh, up or down, uh, it's called uh, a Lamo frequency. Uh, but this depends on uh, uh, G factor times a ball magneton times a uh, 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 magnetic field. So, you know, to extract uh, this G factor, we have to measure uh, uh, magnetic uh, ball magneton and a uh, big magnetic field, which was done by measuring this uh, 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 cyclotron frequency. This is old uh, 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 way of measuring uh, uh, normal magnetic moment. But 2004, uh, uh, Gabriel et al. Uh, noticed that uh, uh, the cyclotron uh, 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 motion has a lambda level for uh, so radial excitation. The energy difference is, is given by this of uh, cyclotron frequency, and uh, uh, ground state uh, uh, level has a, a splitting between spin up and down, and uh, uh, radial excited state also splits spin up and down. 
And if you uh, uh, look at the uh, analysis difference between uh, 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 ground state spin up state and uh, radially excited uh, uh, cyclotron motion spin down state, the analysis difference, if you can measure this energy difference, which can be tuned continuously by the external magnetic field, you can measure directly the uh, uh, normalized magnetic moment. Uh, 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 omega A is proportional to a uh, normalized magnetic moment. Uh, so you can measure directly. Uh, indeed, uh, the data sh I shown here is the uh, 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 latest one, uh, 2008 data. So indeed, they, they, they see the quantum jump between these two states uh, uh, at the accuracy in parts per billion. In the case of muon, uh, this panning, uh, panning trap uh, uh, method cannot be applied because muons are unstable. It decays uh, into electron 100% with a lifetime of about 2.2 uh, microsecond. But here, uh, the key observation is that uh, uh, the difference between you know, spin precession frequency omega s and uh, cyclotron relativistic cyclotron frequency is given by is proportional to a mu times eb over uh, mass so uh, uh, this is a uh, 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 muon stress ring at fermi lab uh, this slide is, uh, is given to me uh, under the courtesy of uh, uh, dr on kim at ibs who is a member of uh, muon fermi lab muon collaboration so this uh, 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 muon storage ring is the uh, uh, same uh, one used to PNL. They exported this to Fermilab, but they improved the V-field and, uh, and uh, the flux of muons. Here is the uh, incoming muon, highly polarized, and it, it uh, circulates uh, this storage ring, which, which has uh, uh, roughly 15 meter in diameter. So initially, it, you, uh, 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 muons come uh, uh, highly polarized. The red arrow, arrow is the spin direction, and the green arrow is the uh, velocity direction beta. And, but if it rotates, uh, uh, as time goes by, uh, the, uh, the, because of the difference between spin precession frequency and the cyclotron frequency, uh, th there is angle uh, difference between uh, uh, momentum direction and the spin direction. But since uh, uh, electroweak interaction, uh, uh, muon decays via electroweak interaction uh, uh, is chiral, the electron decays mostly along the uh, muon spin direction of uh, breaking parity, which is the angle theta zero uh, given by this formula. So this is a, a, a vacuum chamber uh, inside this uh, a storage ring and this dotted line, if you can see, is the uh, muon uh, storage orbit. And the beta is the uh, muon uh, uh, momentum direction. And the S, the S is the uh, spin direction. And as you can see, electrons decay <coughs> along the red line. And it goes through this uh, 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 tracking chamber and arrives at the detector. So uh, inside this uh, vacuum chamber, there is B field up to here, up to this tracking chamber, and then outside here, B field vanishes. This kind of uh, 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 module, detector module, there are uh, 24 of them. This is a uh, uh, ring, uh, ring way out. There are uh, one, there are 20 of the detector here. So uh, you measure these uh, electrons at detector at various angles. So the count of positron or electrons at detector as a function of time t, and there is initial uh, 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 electron positron number. Tau is the uh, time dilated uh, 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 beyond lifetime, and t is time, and a is the amplitude depends on the, uh, electron energy. And this is given by this uh, electric theory, and uh, uh, it depends on this uh, uh, angle between uh, momentum direction and the spin direction of muons. So initially, e, e, uh, uh, roughly here, 10 to 7 uh, positrons uh, uh, decayed and measured. And, uh, and time goes on, the number decreases like this after uh, 100 microseconds. And another 100 microseconds, it goes like this. 
So uh, there are roughly 10 to the uh, nine uh, data points and you, you fit uh, the data, the data, the, the blue dots with this functional form. Uh, this is simplified form, but, but in fact, there are five uh, parameters. So this is five parameter fit. And from that, you can measure accurately with this omega A. From that, you can measure a uh, 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 molecular anomaly A mu. So let me talk about the magnetic field effect. Uh, the operational definition of magnetic dipole moment is, uh, is uh, given by this. This is definition of magnetic moment, G, uh, G factor. So if you apply B field, then uh, uh, energy level of this uh, particle will shift like this. And then uh, 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 you, uh, you take this B field to be zero uh, because this B has to be independent of external parameter. However, uh, in practice, the mic field uh, fields never vanish. In fact, one often, often needs a strong B field like uh, one, one Tesla or with higher. So in view of current accuracy, the effect of magnetic field may not be negligible. On dimensional grounds, uh, one expects the uh, effect of magnetic field to be uh, uh, like this. Alpha finds the constant times EB over M squared. Of, in the case of electron and one Tesla B field, this is roughly 10 to minus 13. And this is uh, comparable to the current experiment uncertainty for electrons, though it's, it's way small for muons because the mass suppression and the experiment accuracy is much lower than uh, electron. However, since we are detecting positrons or electrons in muon G minus two experiment, the might field may not be, might be relevant. I will show that it, it does. For a B field, so B fields less than this uh, 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 cyclotron uh, uh, critical uh, value, uh, one can expand the uh, uh, G factor in powers of magnetic field like this. So uh, QED correction uh, for the, uh, you know, to calculate QED correction, one uses the exact electron propagator to order one or the alpha. Uh, under the uh, constant uh, mark field uh, calculated by Schrodinger, and, they, and then they calculated uh, this one loop uh, exact uh, uh, QED uh, energy shift. And if you expand it in, in powers of B field, you get this formula. Here A2 is the, uh, uh, this value and A3 is this one. And if you apply this to definition of uh, uh, G minus two, you get a uh, leading term is, is uh, two pi over alpha, alpha over two pi, and uh, the linear term, PPL dependent term is given by this. And here, uh, uh, it depends on the uh, spin or mic moment of this uh, uh, pa uh, particle. Plus sign is for spin up, uh, a mic field up, uh, and uh, mic moment uh, parallel to the B field, the minus is uh, anti parallel. The leading correction, uh, which is linear in B, depends on the spin of spin directions. And it is coming from the uh, B scat contribution to the ground state energy. However, since the uh, 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 B scat term in the energy is independent of B field direction, so it contributes equally to spin up and spin down. Therefore, uh, the leading correction to the anomalous moment, moment in B is not measurable at the current uh, panning trap experiment because they, for the uh, current panning trap experiment, they have to measure the energy difference between spin and spin down. So this, this term uh, uh, contributes equally to both spin and spin down, so it cannot be measurable. So the effect will come from the uh, quadratic term. QCD correction uh, uh, up, up to quadratic term, there are uh, uh, five diagrams. Here, uh, the blob is the vacuum, uh, 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 hydronic uh, vacuum polarization contribution, and the cross is the uh, uh, external B field, and solid line is, is, uh, is uh, uh, either elect it's a lepton, and the curly line is a phot uh, photon. 
this is a, a hadronic le a leading correction. And also a light by light correction, one has to calculate. This is light by light and uh, crosses the B field. And this, this uh, dot is the so-called anomalous uh, form factor of uh, 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 pions. This, this uh, uh, dotted lines are pions. So I used uh, pion uh, domination here. And for this uh, uh, form factor, I just used uh, just constant approximation. So you can we calculated this uh, this uh, uh, first uh, diagram is the uh, known result for uh, uh, B and C. I use this uh, 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 vector meson dominance to calculate this diagram. So final result will be uh, like this. So uh, the energy contribution to uh, QCD correction to the ground state energy is is given by this. Uh, note that it comes from alpha squared. Uh, because it's QCD correction. And uh, uh, this C, C2 is uh, 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 vacuum polarization plus light by light bar. And I, I didn't express uh, 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 the uh, uh, vacuum polarization part, but the light by light uh, diagram, uh, we have this expression like this. Here, F pi is a pi and decay constant, and M pi is the pi and mass. So here I use the pion uh, lightest uh, uh, neutral uh, scalar meson uh, dominance. In the current experiment, mark moment, uh, 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 the linear term is not directly measurable as I explained. Uh, the measurable effect comes from a quadratic term, which is 10 to minus 20. Uh, for uh, one Tesla B field and for electrons. So this is unfortunately too small at, uh, to be measurable at current uh, uh, panning, uh, panning trap uh, experiment. Uh, now, let me discuss the reflection under the multi field. A spin precession and a cyclotron frequency difference. Difference is proportional to this A mu and a uh, 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 detective uh, electron at the calorimeter is uh, given by this formula uh, by uh, uh, electric theory. So you fit this data to, uh, uh, to fit, to fit, you fit, you'd fit the data with this uh, uh, formula to extract omega A. However, uh, because of V field, there is a reflection. So here P is the muon decay point and this, this uh, dotted line is direction of a muon beta, and this is spin. So when it decays, the initial angle will be a uh, set zero, which is omega a, a t a times t plus some uh, constant. And a is the exit point. And then it will go to uh, this detector. This solid line will be at the pass, pass of the electrons. And here, uh, 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 this is a boundary market field given by the geometry, but it doesn't matter how it is tilted uh, in our analysis. Uh, so above this, uh, this is a, a top view of this uh, 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 muon uh, detector. So uh, B field is along the Y direction and above here, B field is non-zero, below here, B field is zero. So uh, uh, the pass of this electron will be determined by a least action principle because the electron energy is roughly three GeV. So the uh, 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 the the, uh, the body wavelength is much small, small, uh, quite smaller than scale. So one can use the semi classical approximation. So when uh, energy is, is because energy is conserved, one can use a so-called uh, 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 so-called uh, uh, Mopetri uh, principle. So here P is the initial point P here, and uh, X equal A is the exit point. P1 is momentum in this uh, V field non-zero uh, region. So A is of uh, vector potential, and P2 is momentum over here. So the, this uh, A part will, uh, because of this uh, Lorentz force, the path of electron will be circled. But uh, this can be a, a, a well understood. And the momentum difference is a scheme by this, uh, uh, can be read uh, from this formula. 
And indeed, uh, the deflected angle theta is related, related to incident angle and given by this, this formula. So linear in B field, delta M is the, the uh, energy difference. And the gamma star is, is given by uh, this one. So this is roughly 10 to the minus. Uh, uh, for small tandem theta zero, the incident angle is roughly 10 to the minus 16. But for the generic angle, we find this formula. So the shape of electron distribution changes due to reflection by the mind field. And on the uh, uh, left, left uh, 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 panel, I showed this uh, discrete function and uh, uh, both uh, uh, without, uh, with or without uh, uh, reflection effect. And since uh, the difference, difference in the oscillatory part is 10 to minus 16 in current experiment, this is very small to see. But if you enlarge it, uh, here uh, the plot is I assuming 10 to my just to for the illustration I take this to be 10 to my 13 so you you see this uh, difference but you can see that uh, 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 the this uh, uh, red one is the uh, with, with the reflection and the curve is quite uh, flat near the, the maximum so on the right hand side right right uh, uh, panel I plotted the, the uh, slope of this distribution. And one can see that uh, 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 with deflection, with a reflection, this uh, uh, red, red line is, is quite different from uh, uh, without uh, reflection. In the range uh, of angle, which is uh, delta uh, 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 one or fourth, so this is 10 to minus four. And the dominant part comes from uh, uh, delta uh, uh, one over two, which is 10 to minus eight, minus eight, and the difference is also roughly 10 to minus eight. Okay, so this uh, slope uh, is near the uh, set uh, equal, set equal to pi over two, which is almost one. So uh, in, in a formula experiment, uh, formula experiment, uh, 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 they detect, uh, they have uh, 10 to the, uh, each a, 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 a run subset, they have 10 to the nine uh, positrons detected. So in this uh, angle range, they will have uh, 10 to the five uh, electrons or positrons arriving here. Especially near here, there will be at least uh, <clears throat> 10 of them. But current <coughs> experimental uncertainty is <coughs> roughly a, a, a uh, less than uh, parts per million, so 10 to minus seven or, 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 uh, or, or smaller than that. So uh, this measurement uh, will be important to improve the uh, uh, current uh, accuracy, experiment accuracy, not only measuring the reflection effect. So uh, uh, due to the reflection, the oscillated part shape change is quite small, but near the peak or belly, uh, the shape is new shape very flat for this uh, uh, angle range and the slope differs by 10 to minus eight. So each uh, run subset, uh, 10 to nine positrons are detected at Fermilab. So one should uh, detect 10 to the five positrons in this angle range, which I think is sufficient uh, to distinguish two distributions. Okay, let me conclude. So we have calculated the effect of magnetic fields on the anomalous uh, magnetic moment up to a uh, quadratic order in B field, both QED and QCD. QCD is this is a new result. The accuracy of experiment for magnetic moment is now high enough. Uh, in the case of electrons, parts per billion. In the case of muon, parts per uh, million. So it's, it might be sensitive to magnetic field. Uh, however, a direct measurement of this uh, uh, effect is, is, is from a uh, uh, quadratic order, which is 10 to minus 20, where it's so small. However, in beyond experiment, the distribution electron count is modified linearly in V, 10 to minus 16, very small, but this, uh, uh, the, uh, this is functional uh, fit. So uh, uh, you can look at the slope of the shape change, uh, which changes significantly near the peak of this angle range which is 10 to minus four. And by measuring this change, 
especially the slope difference, uh, which is 10 to minus eight, one could measure the diffraction effect. I think this is very uh, uh, fascinating uh, if one can measure this. Furthermore, to improve the experimental uncertainties, currently it's a uh, uh, parts per uh, million level, but to improve it, one should consider this effect because this uh, unrest light moment is determined by feeding uh, distribution shape of detected positrons. Okay, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you for your interesting talk, uh, for being on time. So we have um, some minutes for discussion and question. Can I have a question? Yes. Yeah. Professor Hong. Yes, yes. Who yeah, yeah. are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm just King. <laughs> okay. You know, this, the normal smiling moment, people talking, there's a, could be some hardware uncertainty. People say, I mean, even though about 4.2 sigma, some difference, the possible source could be also hardware uncertainty. Your way of yeah, doing yeah. this can help to some resolve the, that problem of hardware uncertainty? Yeah, thanks for the question, asking the question. Uh, indeed, uh, the uh, lattice group, a so-called the BMW collaboration, published at the same time as the uh, Formula uh, uh, publication last April, uh, they found that by, you, by this uh, lattice calculation, they found that uh, uh, leading order hadron contribution is quite higher than a uh, previous estimate. So if, if you take this lattice result, uh, the current uh, uh, deviation 4.2 sigma will go down to, I think 2.5 sigma, something like that. But in their analysis, I mean, their R value, the ratio of this cross section, E plus hadron uh, going to E plus E minus, is uh, a bit higher. So uh, still uh, uh, one has to understand this lattice calculation. Yeah, but, but anyway, uh, my point is, uh, I'm not talking about new physics. I'm talking about the improvement of this uh, muon G minus two experiment. So uh, since the uh, experimental uh, uh, accuracy is, is, is extreme, so one has to consider this uh, 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 reflection effect due to my field. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, is there a, a more question? Uh, maybe I, uh, I have a short question on the uh, magnetic effect, magnetic field effect on muon G minus two, I saw electron G minus two. You said the, there's a leading term linear in linear in magnetic field. Uh, which is canceled out for spin up and down. Uh, is it uh, possible to see, uh, I mean, this linear term uh, without cancellation? Um, uh, uh, you always yeah. have a cancellation? Yeah, the can cancellation is, uh, it doesn't mean real can cancellation is, uh, it, <coughs> it is contributes uh, equally, it's, it's spin independent. Uh -huh. So, so it will affect, uh, the, for instance, mass. Yeah. If you consider uh, rest mass as this, uh, including this B field. So uh, uh, I think there will be a, 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 a way to measure this effect, but not at the current uh, uh, panning trap experiment because they measure the energy difference between spin and spin down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then instead of panning trap, I mean, panning trap might be the most precise measurement for electron G minus two, yes. right? Yeah, okay. Now, this may have some significance in, uh, in uh, neutron star physics and so yeah. on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I have a short a... question. Ah, yes, I'm very sorry. Hmm. Yeah. Can, can there be any uncertainty in um, the magnetic field itself, B? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, there are many experimental uncertainties. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, the initial uh, incoming uh, muon momentum uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, you never, um, it never moves uh, on the plane, it, it just oscillates. But those effects, effects are, are, are 
extremely accurately analyzed in uh, uh, in a muon GMI two experiment because they are very important. On the P field effect, the non uniformity of P field is also uh, uh, extremely analyzed. And the furthermore, mm -hmm. here I just use uh, uh, the sharp boundary, but uh, boundary never uh, is never sharp. There is some uh, you know some uh, uh, some width. But it doesn't matter because as, as long as the, I calculated the action, right? Action of this, this uh, uh, electron. Mm -hmm. So near the boundary, as long as the, the size of boundary is much smaller than bulk distance, the uh, contribution to the action will be uh, uh, negligible. So at, at the leading order, I think uh, a non-uniformity of uh, P field and uh, a width of uh, boundary uh, are subdominant. Mm -hmm. I see. But still, you expect to achieve uh, this uh, precision. Yeah. So, so, the, so, so the question is, uh, uh, you know, is uh, you have to uh, the, the the detector resolution has to be good enough. So I don't know uh, what kind of uh, uh, resolution they have at at the formula, but uh, at LHC they use a, a silicon vertex, which has mm -hmm. extreme uh, special resolution. So mm -hmm. I think uh, with that kind of uh, uh, detector. Uh, one should be able to see this effect. I think which will be very, very interesting to me at least. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you for your uh, interesting talk. Uh, thank yeah, thank you. So uh, then uh, let's move on to the next speaker. So next speaker is uh, Professor Chung Sun Kim. Can I, I show you... my screen? Yeah, maybe. Uh, Professor Doki Hong, are you share the screen first? Yeah. Please take out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, now you are. Yeah. You can share your screen. You can, uh, can you make it to, okay, full screen. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah, let me introduce first. Uh, the next speaker for this session is Professor Chung Sun Kim from uh, Yonsei University. He will talk about uh, his title is the uh, is active sub electron neutrino drug or myrana. That is the question. Please. Okay. Well, thank you for the this invitation to this nice workshop. Okay. Anyway. Actually, this great pleasure to me. Today, I'm going to present uh, some nice idea. Ideas on active sub EV neutrino, it is if it is Dragoa Mayana. The work is together with uh, Professor Moti and Professor Rosiak and Dr. Sao. Okay. Due to time limit, I cannot give all the details. I will try to give some ideas. Ideas on these back to back muons and ideas on model independent study of the new physics. Okay, as you know now, neutron has mass, there's tiny mass, okay? It's not the large, so tiny. How tiny? This is the difference between from the lightest charge by electron to this, about possibly 10 to seven all those differences. So still we need to give mass. There's some kind of disadvantages giving Dirac or Mayana masses. Those disadvantages can be resolved by using the CISO mechanism. But still by using CISO mechanism, there's challenges. We have to find out this heavy right hand neutrinos. Okay, we, we haven't seen that. Another is a light one. I mean, sub -EV, I mean, like electron muon tau neutrino, that is, not the Dirac, it should be Mayana in order to use this system mechanism. So we have two challenges, okay? These two challenges can be resolved by using kind of up to now, by using delta L equal two processes, by using the Mayana property neutrinos, I mean like nu equal nu bar. So we can use this kind of general beta beta decay, I mean neutrinos of the decay. Usually nu and nu bar are not like, but here nu and nu coming because of this property or knowledge. This annihilation has actually some kind of penalty, MK there, okay? So using this MK, we can get actually the neutral mass by using neutral, neutral delta decay. But 
because MK I said neutral mass so small, so tiny. This is could be large penalty by using this. Okay, I mean this is the usual diagrams for the, this uh, neutron diameter decay. Not only this, usual call is effective mass of neutron. There's also a large uncertainty from the nuclear matrix element. Anyway, I'm not doing, I'm not talking on this side, so let's go. <clears throat> now, this is the current situation for using these neutron stabilizer decays. This IH means normal hierarchy and NH means inverted hierarchy. Now, from the present, I mean, Kaiske analysis from the super K, that's giving better uh, fitting to the normal hierarchy. Now, normal hierarchy means like here, normal hierarchy is light swing is one that is possible electron time neutrinos. So this relative to the M beta beta. So this could be anywhere from zero like this way, which means there's some very uh, possibility of failure by using this neutron star beta decay to find out if it's Dirac or Mayana. Okay, now I'm going to my main ideas. As I mentioned, there's possible large possibility of this failure, okay, by using this kind of neutron star beta decay to find out if the sub EV neutron is Dirac or Mayana. There's actually alternative to that. Uh, first alternative to the neutral Kashmir effect, okay? But this one is not that good because the difference between this drag minus proportion tiny mass, neutral mass of that. As I mentioned, it's so tiny. So this is horrible actually using this one because there's also large boundary bus forces and some are fluctuation there. Uh, so using this one to get this neutral drag minus is actually horrible. So nobody going to use that. Then there's a nice idea. Now the idea is by using quantum statistics. Okay, and let's assume minor neutrinos and using quantum statistics to the final state of nu nu nuba nuba or nu nuba. Now nu nu and nuba nuba, there's no difference between Dirac and minor because all is identical. But nu nuba case, this difference between Dirac and minor by using this quantum statistics. Okay, so let's choose this kind of the case, L, L bar and nu nu bar, okay? L could be muon or electron or tau, but the uh, tau is not very good. And the muon is better because long track and better reconstruction efficiencies. So we choose B0 decay to mu minus mu plus nu nu bar, okay? So it's bell to is possible place to um, probe that. Now using this one, actually there's huge some kind of obstacle. Obstacle is called practical Dirac minor confusion theorem. From now on, I'm going to say DMCT. Actually, that is Dirac minor confusion theorem. Okay. Consider, as I mentioned, this decay. Then I using the this momentum P on P for neutrinos. Then amplitude for Dirac case like this way. Just suppress this one and put the only P on P two. The minor case, I have to anti-symmetry that because it is nu and nu by same, okay? Just like electron-electron production at the final state like that. Now then, difference of Dirac and minor comes from scale of this one coming from direct term minus exchange term plus interference terms, okay? So there are two terms importance. One is the difference between drag, direct and exchange and interference terms. Now here, Interparent in general, actually coming to the M nu scale. And this in general, actually in special case, this is not the case, but in general, this is coming because of two type, so twice of spin, the highest clip is coming M nu scale. Else also in general, this one, direct term and exchange term is not same. Actually, this is very important. This is, could be called in very special case. BSM case, okay? So I'm going to talk also later on the equal case, but in general, this is not equal. Even though not equal, if, because neutron is not absorbed presently, we have to integrate out because you cannot see that. You cannot use this one. Neutral momentum, you have to integrate out. Then because the full space space, there is a, I mean, like symmetries there. So this is equal. So direct term scale and then pull in, 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 in,
Okay, so you cannot use this very good information, even though it's, it's, if we use this one, we can easily distinguish drag and mana. But because neutron is disappearing, you have to integrate out and this come out this. Okay, if I some kind of give some summary this one, this is generic diagram. It's not the actual it's many model calculation, but I'm saying drag case, you don't need to be symmetric. Mana case must be symmetric, and there's differences like this way. But in order to, because we cannot see momentum of these neutrons, you have to pay space out, integral out, then come out M minus, M minus K. So it's somewhat, even though very useful information is useless. But let's say if we can assume it, you can deduce or import some measure, okay, neutron, the momentas. Then let's assume it's point 0.7 is observable. Then it's totally different to these two cases. Okay, therefore, because of an unobservability of these neutrinos, this integral, this comes out, the difference between drag mana comes is M nu scale. We call this is DMCT, drag mana confusion serum. It's huge some problems there. So practical drag mana confusion serum by Kaiser, Kaiser in 982. But it is actually not theorem at all because there are no general proof independent process or observables, okay? This has been done only in these cases. Okay, this history of this DMCT, kind of gamma master nunuba. So some kind of um, not that just uh, a three level, root level induced this nunuba, and then shrug did the, like that nunuba, and then e plus e plus e plus e minus This two body final state. I mean, you cannot do anything, it's disappearing. So it's something like missing some rate. That's all. And then there comes the three body final state, k to the pi, e plus e minus this way. Excited ground state nucleons coming like this way. All this still, let's say example, k on comes pi on and disappearing. You cannot, I mean, deduce or imagine neutral moment or anything. So still you have to integrate out. So come up PDMCT. So that was the case up to now. Now, but the, that's not all actually. There was some progress. 982, this case did, actually there was a guy, 98 by SP Lawson, that if there's new physics, then you don't need the full integral, there's still difference, drag mana. So that's one thing. And then Chabra Babu, this 1992, the paper this day, actually, if you can measure Nunuba, actually, as, as I mentioned here, they said, okay, the paper said, if you can measure neutron to momenta or some deduce or something, you can do it, then you can do it, then you can I mean, exchange the, the difference. So there's, if I summarize this kind of flow chart, okay, Ah, the power momentum of neutral nuba can be measured or deducible or something. If no, you have to integrate it out, comes out here. If there is any new physics, something exotic things, no, then comes out, that is the, this PMDM, PDMCT, the, the Kaiser papers in this way. But this is not whole. There's actually this, if, yes, yes, there's plenty, lots of abundant information here, where's property here. So, we have to find out going this, yes, yes. That is, we have to find a summa, not fully integral, which means you have to find some major or deduce neutral momenta. Then you cannot go this way, you can come here. If there's some new, some new piece that can come here, then you don't, this not coming M nu square, something like independent M nu, a violet PDM city. So this is kind of things. Okay, so we have to, I'm going to talk two things. One is one, how to deduce so some, some may observe into momenta. That's one thing. Second part of my talk, is, I'm, I'm just giving ideas today. So uh, for this one, okay? Some in neutrino, some, some new physics pact. So first one is something like B0 goes to mu mu nu nu ba, okay? <clears throat> Here, this one is, uh, uh, if the case is this way, this is, uh, restaurants can non restaurant. Restaurants can be to D mu nu, D goes to mu nu. But non restaurants come like quack level this way. This for Dirac, for minor case, but you have to anticipate here, minus here, which means actually uh, nu by here, P1 is P2, like this way. Okay? So exchange, moment exchange. In order to this, uh, show this somewhat better way, even though nu m, nu m same, I have to put here in some way, I put. Uh, some kind of bar here, just the bookkeeping, okay? I mean, see this momentum change here. 
but here is like this way, but here, so P1, P2 is changed, momentum is changed. So first the possible experiment to consider something like a collinear case, which means here, nu and nu are momentum same, something like this way. Then it means this mana case, just like electrons come the same place, must be zero. Collinear case, Dirac case, Dirac case need not be zero, but mana must be zero. Okay, so this is possibility. I mean, this uh, neutron, uh, neutrons like missing energy. The missing energy comes very least, something zero, I mean, almost zero comes out. Then it's collinear case, there's possible this, uh, this deep, large difference. Actually, collinear cases, Dirac case, non need M nu scale, but the mana case must be zero. So this is possible places. The better place would be between muon cases, okay? We are talking this decay again. Now in the rest of the beam mass on here, mu and mu one, mu minus mu plus come back to back, which means that apply same with the three moments, same side, opposite directions. Then nu nu also back to back, okay? Now B zero is the rest frame. Now this back to back, this must also back to back. So I know I can, this all, E mu is measurable, but E mu is calculable. Because this mass is almost zero, P mu, size of P mu is also calculable. Everything known. This one, M nu nu, nu missing is calculable, M mu is measurable, so also calculable. All other kinematic functions, all calculable things, measurable, calculable. Only unknown things, angle between nu nu and nu mu nu okay. That angle actually is theta. So actually coming, H5 dimensional interval comes two dimensional the D gamma of D, D E mu scale, D sine theta like this way. As I mentioned, sine theta is actually present and unobservable, but this is observable. And E mu is actually same as the E nu. So when you measure this one, actually you are measuring neutral electron, the neutral momenta, neutral energy distributions. So you don't need the full integrals. So overcoming the MCT. This is the good idea of back to back muons. Now, I can give some better ideas by using helicity the configuration. Before going to helicity configuration, I go to helicity difference cell chirality for the non-zero mass. Because neutrons now, even though time is non-zero, if zero, the total different. But because non-zero, there is some small component there. This is actually difference between helicity and the chirality. Usually, positive helicity for particles Mostly light hand photon, I mean, ultra less the case, but there is small component of positive left handed, that is M over 2E. M over 2E is for neutral case, almost zero. I mean, I said non zero because tiny, but almost zero. Muon case, mu M mu of E mu is like 2 E mu, is like 0.04. It's also kind of ignorable. This is different from the pi on decay to mu nu. Pi decay to mu nu case, you, mean, you say many times there's uh, such a helix diagrams for the pi in the rest frame, the mu nu. There, mu one is actually quite energetic. Uh, not only energetic, it's mass, okay. M over E is actually order one. So in that case, in this case, M over E is almost one. So M as a minus one could be right hand, left hand, both together. So you have to draw plus minus, you have to draw four diagrams of configuration. but you find the experiment to find only two is possible to get that parity violation and CP conservation. Same as we can do that. Visual rest here, going to mu back, back to back mu and nu nu bar, like you say. Put the, like this momentum, like you say, and the bar here uh, is actually that is uh, uh, bookkeeping, like this. And if for the minor case, I'll do it. Anyway, this uh, Dirac case coming out this way, and the set has this angle between these two, present unknown. Uh, pre unobservable, but anyway, I can do this kind of things. For Dirac case, only this one. For minor case, now only this one, I have to anti symmetrize because the uh, nu nu bar is same. Now, nu bar here actually same like this way, but I, as I mentioned, bookkeeping as a mu bar here for the momentum exchange here, like this way, same thing here come out P2. So, minus here. So, this come out, come out set here like this way. So, Dirac case. From here, momentum spin conservation. I know this uh, uh, scale of this is one minus cosine of the scale. <clears throat> but uh, this uh, uh, mana case, I have to this one and anti symmetric, which means scale with this one plus this one, uh, pi minus theta here scale like this. 
So this combined, this one is one plus cosine theta square and one square one minus cosine theta. So this distribution totally different if we can measure it, okay? So this is the case, a minor case, uh, a drug case, totally different. But I may, as I mentioned, this is unobservable. So this is unuseful, no, no, it's quite useful because this unobservable means I have to integrate it out. The integral gives total different branching fractions, which means large rate differences. Uh, M uh, mana case much larger than Dirac cases because of this kind of properties, as I mentioned. Now, detailed analysis, I cannot give time limit because I cannot give, I'll give some kind of discussions only. Okay, the result, I, we, as I did, uh, did the full calculation analytical we did, not only just helistic configuration, the result comes out like this way as function sine set and emu, like this way. Emu is actually, emu, same thing, even though we don't see that, emu distribution actually electron, uh, new, uh, new, new time neutral distribution actually. Uh, like uh, if you see that this cosine set is like this way. So total different and then large difference rate differences. Now, presently neutron is uh, missing, totally missing, but future, let's say think future cases. Angle set as angle between nu, 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 and nu, mu, mu, nu, nu, ba, actually mu plus and nu, ba angle the, uh, defined such a way. Now, future is detector, let's say, assuming this is neutral near detect possible, nu can from mu minus, mu, ba from mu plus, can be detected as well, assuming. Now, neutral is Dirac cases, then nu and nu, ba different. Zeta can be uniquely decided. This is the case. So this come out of my cosine the scale. Now, matter case, actually, nu, nu and nu are same. They have to symmetrize that, okay? So need the anti symmetry that comes, I mean, not just with high, uh, just helast configuration, from the experiment configuration comes same thing on pre consensus scale. Now, because as I mentioned, this zeta, present zeta is unknown. We have to just uh, integrate out. It comes out like this, integral of this one, present zeta. Then the gamma, uh, the Dirac case and the matter case, energy distribution. This is muon energy, also elect the new neutral energy distribution too, same thing. So this is almost same and slight different. Difference is three pi e mu k mu, k mu is kinetic energy, muon energy, total energy, and k mu is almost same as e mu because it's energetic, quite energetic here, from the B meson, okay. So this is kind of same thing, three e mu scale, then this 10 minus some 9.4, the 10, that's the giving to a large difference here. And this difference is not M new scale. Uh, I said total integration, full pace integration is M new scale. Uh, part of the strict pace integration is the M new scale. Now, discussions on this. Now, if we calculate that, uh, the result, this is only for the resonance contributions, okay? I mean, this is easy to calculate anyway. Uh, uh, this probably the smaller than the non resonance. Anyway, for resonance contribution only coming out. Uh, BD case uh, 10 to minus 12. Uh, that not necessarily there's three point patterns, FA, FB, FC. F is dominant one. So I put the as constant one actually like this way for the uh, simple calculations. Then 10 to minus 12 order. And the minor case 10 to minus 11. But this is not all because not, we did only B0. There's B0 bar there. Also not only muon, there's electrons. So you have to pull fold. So this comes about 10 to minus 10. Presently, we have like, uh, no, no, the designed belt two, not the present, okay? Designed belt two is actually have, they're going to five times 10 to eight. So we need kind of 20 times more, which means uh, future uh, next generation of B factories to get it. And the future is detected by Page, Masula, and some others. They can even distinguish this one. And that will be a better one. Uh, some background, almost no background actually. At the paper, we did all the similar process. Now, final lecture. Model independent nuclear studies, okay? As I mentioned, there are two, two, two ways. One is the giving the some kind of pace space to some momentum will induce, uh, deduce or measure it. The other is nuclear can overcome DMCT. Let's use the KD case, B to K nude case or K to pi nude case. Uh, these standard model diagrams, now uh, for the general process, okay, to PF, PI to PF nunu, like this way, then this is most uh, general effect of Lagrangian. 
Now J is like the effect hardware current transition, transition current. J, V and J, A could possibly new the standard model. Okay, the others also new physics. Now most of the general decay amplitude coming like this way. Now this is all compact is F minus this is almost zero, because in, uh, almost zero neutral masses. Anyway, this way. Now my case, not only not uh, not as uh, complete this way, because symmetrization, anti-symmetrization, we have there's no uh, vector case, no tensor case, only like uh, scalar and uh, like this way, and the axial vectors like this. So now, how, how can be possible observations? Missing mass chaos, actually, because noon bar case, missing mass can be observable. Also, moment, number event, but there's possibly large uncertainty. Uh, final mass of moment, the momentum, the mass of momentum, this case, but this related missing mass. Okay, so we're going to use missing mass here. Uh, independent, uh, some kind of moment, in the, the more the independent ways using the epsilon gel, epsilon like this way. The standard one case one put here, and then Dirac and the Mara case, uh, quite different using the here, uh, much simpler for the Mara case anyway. The uh, uh, sigma and delta is uh, just function of number, but this kind of, uh, of uh, the important because of this related S, a missing mass, okay, kind of the parameter variable. So we can missing mass here for the K to case, V to K. Now, Slight different, but uh, this epsilon zero bottom is the epsilon, epsilon zero one two. So this is the uh, uh, tensor case, vector case, actual vector, and the scalar case for the, this one. Well, slight different, but anyway, as I mentioned, hence there's no tensor contribution for my case here, so it comes like this way. Vector case, same, because of the, uh, uh, the same coming out, uh, there's no difference between that, dragon minor. So this is. But uh, if we use the B2K, we can, uh, if the new physics, not only difference in the rate, also you can distinguish that. Now, final comment is like this way. Let's use this one, choose processes. As I mentioned now, X and Y could be single and multi. Y could be null. And for moment of P, X, P, Y are measured now. The K amplitude, M is MDs like this, Dirac case, Mara case, anti symmetric MD scheme is MM scale. The calculate with direct term minus exchange term plus inter interference terms. Now, in general, I said, like in this, all the standard cases in general, but special case could be, I mean, could be equal. That could be like collinear case, also this equal like this way or minus or this way. Now, collinear case, if we do the calculation, this one coming is actually direct case scale. This is non zero direct case. The difference is only direct case scale because this is zero, minus case zero. Excuse me, you have uh, five uh, case, minutes. Yeah, just one minute. Can I use that? Okay, thank you. 46, 44 minutes. Okay. Okay. Now, this one, <laughs> if I difference uh, the symmetric case, Dirac case scale, in anti symmetric case, minus Dirac case. So, this is actually quite different. Now, stand, standard mode case, just noon by is actually uh, a non zero. Uh, and then if we do the help in the MD minus case, comma, M minus K. Now, I uh, conclude that. Uh, B Mason case and K Mason case implementing a perimeter statistics by using the very special kind of configuration, we can actually back to beyond this in rest premise that we can distinguish overcoming PDMCT. And B, by using the new peaks also to be the K and K, uh, this is one of the examples we independent the new peaks scenarios we find that easily can distinguish. Okay. The neutral stability decay has quite a limitation by using it because tiny neutral mass. In the case of so small, uh, there's large possibility in failure. Then only by alternative could be this one, which I mentioned this, okay? Now this was the, the diagram which I showed that, and this collaborators, okay. Now the, this end. Okay, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, are there any uh, question? Uh, maybe I can ask a question. Okay. Uh, thank you for your uh, interesting overview to identify uh, whether neutrinos Majorana or Dirac. Uh, in your actually in the, the second part of your talk, 
uh, you said the P2K Nunuba mm -hmm. and uh, in combination of new physics. So what kind of new physics? You said the scalar or tensor cases, uh, you could distinguish, right? Between yes, Corona yes. and Dirac cases. Scala, yeah, yeah. So yeah. what kind of the scalar new physics means it's a kind of laptop quark scenarios that you had in mind or? Oh, actually uh, we didn't do any mind because I, as I mentioned, we did the model independent analysis mm -hmm. uh, as I did, I showed there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, using the, this most general, just mm. uh, this way and, and like this way. Mm. Uh, and then how much this coming on or the epsilon zero, mm. epsilon, epsilon two, like this way. So mm. we don't know, we just put the uh, ah, large yeah. the epsilons here, epsilons here, and put the epsilon here is like this way at the color diagrams here. And uh, zero here is the epsilon, put epsilon zero one to zero, which is older down there. Put mm -hmm. the epsilon larger, getting like this way, the difference mm -hmm. here, like this way. So I didn't do any have such a in mind any new physics ideas. Uh, okay. Probably three double uh, models might be. I, I, I see the scalar or well, should scalar operators, uh, you are correcting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah For the, this K Nunu, I mean, mm -hmm. if there's uh, any contribution to the K Nunu through the mm -hmm. some scalars, mm -hmm. then could come out this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any more question? Okay, uh, so maybe I can uh, ask one yeah. more question on the- uh, Because there's still one more minute left. Yeah, first part of your talk, you said the, uh, uh, in the case of back-to-back, -back, mm. uh, actually <laughs> I mixed <laughs> between different, but uh, you are talking about uh, in the case of Majorana neutrinos, uh, they are, they collinear limit the um, amplitude for the collinear limit vanishes, so that you can distinguish in principle between Majorana and Dirac cases. And then you also consider the integral of the momentum, but the still you are uh, integral of the phase space. Uh, in the collinear limit, right? You don't no, no. the full I, integral. I, I showed you two examples. Mm -hmm. One is collinear case, mm -hmm. one is back to back case. Uh -huh. Okay. Now back to back case, I mean I know because so this is not full phase integrals. Mm -hmm. This is the okay. No, this is let me see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now back to back case is uh, experimentally, muon muon comes uh, back to back in the rest frame of B. Mm -hmm. Okay, even though I don't see neutrinos, mm -hmm. neutrinos must also, must be also back to back mm -hmm. because momentum conservation. Yes, because of this E mu is measurable, E mu is calculable because M B is known. Mm -hmm. So we know everything. I mean, even though we don't see that neutron energy, neutron momentum, size, everything known. Mm -hmm. Only unknown things. Mu mu line and nu nu line. So this is not full phase space integral. Right. This is very special kinematic configuration that yeah. restricts the phase space integral. Mm -hmm. I see. And this not, doesn't not be M nu square dependence. Okay, I see. It's the same thing like this way. As I mentioned, if I know E nu, okay, we don't need to integral of this, use the, these distributions, then easily distinguish them. Right. Now only we don't know this neutral momentum anything. We mm. have to face full face mentera comes this way. Mm. By back to back or collinear, we mm. know the information of this. Mm. We don't need to integral of that full face mentera. We mm. can use the that configuration, get it that. That's what mm. I said. I see. Yeah. So so in the currently the we have the bell two uh, has uh, no sensitivity yet, right? Yeah. Not yet. As yeah. I mentioned, this yeah. actual sense is quite small. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, we calculate the non nesolans case. Resonance could be larger. Mm -hmm. Still, using non nesolans this 10 to minus 11. Fourfold means 10 to minus 10. Mm -hmm. Now, presently designed one is 5 times 10 to 8. Fully, mm -hmm. uh, we need a fully reconstruct B because we, we want to rest of B0, okay? Right, and right. missing. Mm -hmm. 
we need to pull the known disinformation of an initial state, mm -hmm. which is fully this constant B0, not just total B0. B, total B is about 10 to 11, I um, mean, designed one, I mean, nasty, but fully reconstruct, they're going to have a five times 10 to eight. So still difference between 10 to minus 10 and 10 to minus five times 10 to eight. So we need the next, next uh, generation of B factory. Mm -hmm. Even without this uh, near detectors like future detector, we can still distinguish because the large difference in the rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you uh, for your interesting talk. I think the, uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Chung Sun Kim for his nice talk. And this is the end of the morning session. So we uh, will resume our afternoon session at 1.40. So now we are changing the topic to uh, back to gravitational waves in the la next two uh, sessions, okay. Uh, thank you for all the speakers and the participparticipants. Uh, see you in the afternoon. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs>